bases dropped on the morning kickoff here on SDH. Thank you for uh, giving us a day off yesterday. We went from soccer degenerates to golfing degenerates again yesterday. And I'm just going to warn you, uh, we might be getting addicted. So Tuesday shows could get a little sketchy in terms of scheduling. But we do make you a promise that when we are going to be away with a live show on Tuesdays, or away from the live show, we will have some recorded content for you. John will get you caught up on everything going on in the USL, League One, and the championship. I'll try to drop Soccer Files episodes on a regular on Tuesday, and it was a, a fun one for me last night, a story that pretty much when you read about the history of American professional soccer, this era gets kind of glossed over a lot of, well, you had two leagues in 1967, and there's a lot of backstory to that. Then they merged together in 1968. Then everybody went out of business, and then you only had five teams in 1969. Not quite that simple. There was a lot of twists and turns. So what I did on, on Soccer Files last night is I got you from the end of the 68 season when the Atlanta Chiefs won the title to December 31st, 1968 to get to the end of that year where everything was up in the air. Nobody knew if there was going to be a league, what it was going to look like, who was going to be in it, um, all kinds of madness. So that's something that I'll try to do in, in these soccer files episodes is find some of those stories that maybe you've heard the, not even the cliff notes versions because cliff notes had more than, than five pages. Some of the, some more detailed stories that we can dig deeper into and, and go back through the news archives and, and find you some interesting quotes. Now, one of the elements of that one that I thought was interesting, um, and it came up a lot in the early days of American professional soccer, and it was experimenting with the laws of the game. The whole notion that well, Americans don't like low scoring games. They've loved baseball forever. So, you know, I'm just saying. Um, and baseball can be pretty low scoring, except when they juice the baseballs, which is always fun. And, you know, they don't like to tell you about that. And then sometimes they do it the other way, which they don't like to tell you about that either. They like to make you think that everything is normal and consistent. <laughs> anyway, there is a lot of talk about rule changes. And one of the executives of the NASL from 68, one of the, the team executives was saying, oh, we need we need more goals. We need more attacking you know, we need to get rid of the offside rule. It needs to be kind of like hockey with the blue line and, and blah, 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 blah. Well, this stuff continues on um, today. And now we have reports out of the Netherlands that the KNVB, the Dutch Federation, is going to test some new rules, or they want to anyway, in the second division of the Netherlands from 2023 onwards. So this would be a test, and they, they need to get IFAB approval. That's something the NASL didn't always do back in the day. They were just kind of like, yeah, you know, sure, we'll make a 35-yard offside line just because. So the KNVB is trying to get approval to have a bunch of rule changes to test. I don't know if doing all of these at once is the best idea, but anyway, throw-ins becoming kick-ins. You, you want radical change? Well, there you go. Uh, Roy Delap wouldn't have a problem with this, but moving from throw-ins to kick-ins, allowing players to dribble from free kicks. Okay. Um, Five-minute penalties after a yellow card. So we're going to have a penalty box in, in the Netherlands. That was something that was talked about in the NASL in 1968. Didn't happen. Might happen in the Netherlands in 2023. Infinite subs. I don't know what that means exactly. I don't know if it's sub in and out, free subs, or if you can just sub everybody that's on your game day roster. And the other one that has come up lately, clear playing time. Two 30-minute periods, and I'm guessing they would stop the clock every time the ball goes out, that kind of stuff. Personally, I'd like to see 240s if you're going to go to that road. But anyway, just judging from what stoppage time typically is, I'd like to see... 240s as opposed to 230s but that's just me um this is crazy and it's a lot of crazy and look i mean there's been talk about throw-ins becoming kick-ins before i've never heard anything about dribbling from a free kick i've heard because it's come up in this country before about the uh the sin bin <laughs> i think that's what they call it in the uk uh the five minute penalty a penalty box maybe we can get some of those uh cool moments that we get in the nhl the infinite subs, look, we see it at youth levels here. We, we see it in different games. Uh, some other parts of the world probably use it, too. The clear playing times become a topic. But all of it at once, 
Um, I don't know how much you're going to learn about each individual experiment. If you do it that way, they might need to reimagine how they do this, but this is a big talking point right now. And I think VAR is a big reason why we, we see the game a little bit differently. We'll see where it goes. Um, I don't even really know how to feel about a lot of these. The, the penalty box thing is fascinating. Um, it would absolutely change a lot of things that people get frustrated about in the game. I, I I would be curious to see how that would go. I don't love throw-ins becoming kick-ins. Um, dribbling from a free kick, I get the logic, I guess. I, I don't I don't hate it. If you want to do that, go for it. Um, I guess you'd still have to give the yardage. The clear playing time, we've had the discussion. Um, there's a lot of different ways to handle that. I don't think 230 minutes is the way to go. I think it needs to be more time. And maybe there's other ways to deal with it where you don't have to get to that. I don't know. Maybe there's a little bit of a professional game standard of that versus an amateur game where you don't have like a scoreboard clock, for example. Infinite subs, I'm not a fan of. I actually like five subs. I think, you know, they've hit on a number that works for everybody involved. That's just my take right now without any research into it. Um, I'd love to see where this goes. I'd love to hear your thoughts on it. You can tweet him at us at soccer down here. You can share him on the Twitch pitch and, and we'll see what the rest of the crew thinks about it here in just a second. But as always, the morning kickoff, which this one was a little spicier than usual. The morning kickoff is presented by kickoff coffee company, kickoffcoffeeco.com. Go there, order your coffee so you can enjoy the morning kickoff with us. And a lot of you have done that, which is awesome. Thank you for doing that. Thank you for supporting a great organization. Put in the code soccer down here 15. You'll get 15% off of your purchase. And 10% of kickoff coffee's proceeds go to supporting soccer-based youth development organizations worldwide. Um, I've worked in a soccer-based youth development organization. I've seen firsthand the impact that that kind of an organization can have on kids. Um, one of the most rewarding things I've ever done in the game was coach a, a group of high school age guys in East Point. And now many years after the fact, seeing those guys with family, seeing those guys working, doing well, uh, some of them are still playing. It's just awesome to see. So soccer can change the world and kickoff coffee is supporting organizations that use soccer to change the world. And we support kickoff coffee and they support us. So we're all friends here and trying to make the world a better place. So kickoffcoffeeco.com. Soccer down here, 15 is your code, and you'll get 15% off. And know that 10% of the proceeds are going to great organizations that use soccer to change the world. Well, guys, uh, the Netherlands is trying to change the soccer world with these uh, rule changes that are pretty crazy all at once. I mean, we've talked about aspects of it. Um, Jarrett, could you imagine if you had a penalty box in a New York Red Bulls Philadelphia Union match? Yes, it would be called the field. <laughs> no, 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 Jarrett. The people would actually have to leave the field and teams would have to play shorthanded for a period of time when they do the things that they normally do on the field. Then it turns into a five aside at some point. That might happen. That's that was what yeah, I was getting at. That would be interesting with all of the with all of the cards and all of the penalties and all of the folks in the penalty box you could be five aside which would make for interesting television and for interesting viewing what if you i mean and I, so imagine a team who uh you know a team like atlanta likes to play um nyc can play this way uh you get pos like teams that like to have the ball that get in a penalty penalty kill situation <laughs> we're just gonna pass it around you Mm -hmm. like, oh, yeah. we, we got a guy in the box for two minutes. Cool. Like play it back to the keeper. We're just going to pass it back and forth. If you get overly aggressive, we might try and break over the top or something, but otherwise we'll just pass and run the clock out. But see, that is the thing here. And, and that's where this gets interesting because you have to think, okay, I get the understanding. They, they want a more punishment for a yellow card. Okay, cool. But does it actually help? And this is where the offside rule comes up all the time, because I've had, I can't tell you how many people over the years say offside rule stupid. That's why there's low scoring games. If you took away the offside rule, I don't know if there's more scoring. Like forwards could stand next to the goal if they want to. And then defenders would stand next to the forwards. And I don't think you get a better game that way. There's always a counter move. So if you have a Philadelphia, sorry, Rich, 
I'm, I like to use Philadelphia as an example here when we're talking about yellow cards or shenanigans. So Philadelphia gets a yellow card. Jose Martinez is in the uh, the sin bin for five minutes. Thank you for picking the correct player. Yes. It's easy. Yeah, it's an easy one with them. Um, so then what? Like Philadelphia will probably try to waste time as much as possible. Does that make the game better? Nope. Well, John, no, you, you can't do what you're doing, man. Like you, you can't do that because it's not an easy answer. Is the game better by doing the shenanigans they do now without yellow cards being more? I don't know. Like, I haven't seen it. So just because a team could doesn't mean that they would. Playing shorthanded is a pretty significant disadvantage. That's a kind of a common standard of, of the game, right? Yeah, well, and, I, and we've also discussed the idea that teams, when they're a man down, sometimes they play a little more freely offensively. But no, they don't. <laughs> no, they don't play more freely offensively when they're a man down. What? What? Some teams do. I mean, I no, know they don't. Who? I've seen teams in the past sit there and feel like they can uh, attack with ten. Yeah, against eleven, yeah. they can attack more. Mm-hmm. John, can you drink more Mountain Dew, please? I can't. Please do, um, because it's usually the other way around, as we've talked about when. A team gets a uh, gets a, a send off, and they're playing shorthanded. What what do they usually do? Not attack more freely, defend. Oh, absolutely! It's it's uber defending at that point. Okay, okay. Drink, chug the Mountain Dew, please. Mm-hmm. Um, Jared, I mean, go back to the the Red Bulls game in nineteen, I believe it was, where the Red Bulls were kind of trying to play against Atlanta United. They got a red card kind of early. And it just clarified things. It's like, oh, yeah, we're not going to do any of that anymore. Let's just do what we do and defend and and press from a little bit deeper position and good to go. Like, it clarifies the game that way. So would having a five-minute shorthanded situation be better or worse? I don't have an answer to that because it's very different than a 45-minute period of time or a 20-minute period of time where you're playing shorthanded. You know, could you try to kill the clock for five minutes? It's it's different than say yeah. hockey. I mean, it's yeah. you, the field. Yeah. The field's a different size. The the game moves at a different speed. Things happen differently. It's not apples to apples. It's apples to star fruit. It's it's different. Um, it's hard to quantify it in that sense. That um, yeah, okay, somebody's out for five minutes. Okay, well, are you going to pour forward? Like, you know, are we going to? Are we going to like basically consider something a penalty kill unit? Or are we going to? Bring people on to be part of that penalty kill unit. How are we going to do this? Like, I'm I'm very interested. Like, how would they go about? They go about quantifying that. I mean, you're going to do like temper. You're going to you're going to bring in temporary subs. Like, oh man, we're down a man no, for five no, minutes. No, well, if you if you combine everything, yes, and and this yeah. is why I think the the Dutch Federation idea of wanting to do one, two, three, four, five different things all at once in the second division is too much. Like. Yeah. I would like to see the effect of having yellow cards have a five minute, you know, you're pulled off the pitch, you come back on after five. I'd like to see the effect of that in the normal game that we know today, you know, where you can't just have free subs. Like you can't have a penalty unit. Come on. Like, you know, like I want to see what that would do. Is that, is that a good kick up to the next level of, yeah, yellow card is significant. Is it certain yellow cards? Get it. That might be a better way to look at it. Um, Let's go to the others because I think the others are maybe a little more cut and dried. Um, the allowing players to dribble from free kicks. So all that does is it gives you one more option from the attacking perspective of being able to take off on the dribble as opposed to having to play the ball one revolution forward to go. I don't have a problem with that one. Yeah. That, that doesn't seem like a dramatic change. No, it doesn't. I mean, you know, then you're you're moving the game along. You're getting the, the quick start. And then the defense closes. I mean, it's just none of, none of the rest of it. It's just it's it simply gives the attack one more weapon. Yeah, uh, it, it's it doesn't make the game faster because you can already play fast. Like none of that changes. All it does is it gives the attack one more weapon off a of free so, kick. Cool. So would it be you know you can approach it and start dribbling and then once you make that touch and it takes that revolution then the defense can start closing down ten yards on you? Yeah, I mean once you go you okay. game yeah. on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
you don't get like a 10 yard window for a certain period of time. Or that's I'm it. just making sure. Yeah, that wouldn't that make sense. I'm just making sure I have it clear, but that's okay. I, this cool. is how I see it. it. It's, it's the Dutch who knows what happens, but I'm, I'm giving you how I would do it. I think once the ball's in play, the ball's in play. And yeah. this would allow you to rather than have to pass the ball to somebody with that first touch, you can just dribble it with the first touch Yeah, and ball in play, ball in play. Yeah. Throw-ins becoming kick-ins. Um, I think this is a dramatic change, an absolutely dramatic change, because just think about something that, that we talk about all the time when you're defending and you can see the throw because you're, you're stuck. You have to give up the throw. You're trapped. This would make you think twice about that, wouldn't it? Because mm-hmm. then it turns into essentially a corner kick um, and an angled corner kick, which is very interesting. Um, I I don't know how I feel about it because on one side, it's a huge change. On the other, man, it does kind of promote teams wanting to keep the ball in play more. So I don't necessarily hate it. I'm just here for the first time someone scores from a, from a kick-in. It'd be like the first game. I mean, it, like, it'd be no, directly from a kick in. Like, no, you can't do like, that. Nope. Well, I guess that'd be different because you can't score directly from a throw now. Now they'd have to address that because that you can't score directly would. from a corner, but you can't score. You can't throw it into the net. So they'd have if if that rule stays, then nothing really changes with it except you can kick it a lot farther than you can throw it unless you're Rory Delap. Um. Uh, I would really want to see numbers on that one and see how how it it changes the game by itself, not with all this other nonsense, like by itself, because that's an intriguing one to me about would it promote teams trying to keep the ball in play more rather than hoofing it into the stands? Yeah. That for me is the element here and in all of that, you know, trying to make sure that, when you're trying to, when you have that rush coming on you as a defender, uh, the natural inclination when there's pressure there is to just, you know, dump it in the row Z. Now, you know, with this particular rule, you wouldn't be able to, to do that anymore without this consequence. And so I think that this particular rule that they're, that they're looking at, in combination with all the others, I don't know if you could get a true gauge to its own effectiveness. I think that if you were going to do a rule first, then put this one in first or put this one in last. Don't have it as a part of that group. It's not about first or last. It's it's you got to measure it compared to the game currently. And by doing all this other stuff, you're changing the game and you're you're not measuring it. Like you you can't measure. There's no control when you're doing your your test here. A um, couple of things from the Twitch pitch. Uh, Katie says it's it's effectively combining elements of youth soccer, high school soccer, and hockey. It's a lot. I agree. It's too much all at once. I I don't mind really any of them as a test, but I don't like them all at once. Um, There would be a ton of time wasting related to every kick in for sure burned. Um, Maybe not so much time wasting, but just think about a corner, how a lot of times that's going to take time to set up. You're going to have to do that as well. So it's going to take clocks, but if you're combining it in this sense with the effective time, then the clock stopped. So the time wasting doesn't really matter except for just how long we're sitting there watching it. Um, There would obviously be questions just like we talked about with the, could you go directly to goal from the kick in? Cause you can't with a throw. Could you kick it in back to the keeper and they could pick it up like you can with a throw. Um, Could you have offside on a kick in right now? You don't on a throw. Those, Those are all really good questions that we just, you know, don't really know the details to yet and i don't know how well thought out this is what it sounds like is this is a proposal that is going to be put forth to ifab they're going to approve what can be tested i don't think they will go for this all lumped into one league testing it um maybe the second division does a test maybe the third division does a test maybe the fourth division does a test and you see it in different leagues that's typically how they've tested this stuff um, I, I've said this before when it comes to VAR and, and Jared, I want to get your, your last thoughts on this. Are you going to you join us in second hour, Jared? I'm going to try. You were going to try. Okay. Yeah. Well then maybe you can think more about this then, but I'm going to yeah. ask you now. So you get into VAR changing the game as we know it. it. It feels very different with VAR than it did before. We've talked about this since VAR came in that, 
now you have to look at the laws of the game in a little more detail because we see things that we didn't see before. We, we, we just consider different things about the game that we didn't consider before because of being able to see it on replay. Are any of these in these proposals from the Dutch Federation, are any of these in your mind good ideas for the game or is there something else you would like to see tested? Beyond the offside rule test, which has actually been going on in the uh, Italian U, I think it was the U19s, if I remember right. And it did kick up the the level of scoring just a little bit. Is there anything else or are these good? What kind of wears your mind with the laws of the game at this point? Um, my mind isn't really anywhere in terms of making grand changes. Um just because it's 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 kind of hard to get out of that paradigm for me personally sometimes where I'm not thinking about what needs to be that change until I see something happen and oh no that makes sense it wouldn't have occurred to me and sometimes it doesn't occur to me until you get to those moments where you're thinking okay that change makes a lot of sense we should do that um, the kick-ins would be very interesting just like do you have to declare one or the other I mean you know does the offside as Katie Could mentioned does the offside the rule yeah, that'd There's be interesting. Option. No, that's see now. Can, Jared, can, you, I th- can I th- can I th- can I th- can I like? Oh, it goes out of bounds. Can I just set the ball down like a free kick and play a, a through ball real quick to someone who's fifteen yards off? I would assume so if the offside is okay on a kick in. But then the other question would be, if you kick it in, do you can you not be offside? But if you throw it in, can you be offside? Do you get to choose if you want to throw it in or kick it in? We're getting into all kinds of craziness here. Yeah, it gets really weird. Um. As far as other, like, um, I mean, concussion subs were like the, like the last thing we, you know, we were we bantered about. You know, the five sub rule, like, do you go temporary subs if you do like the whole like put people in the sin bin kind of thing? Like, it's a lot of questions that you can and you can ask, but a lot yeah. of those questions build off the original questions. I I don't think if you're gonna go sin bin yellow card is five minutes or certain yellow card fouls are five minutes. I would assume you would not be able to to sub freely on those. I, I would assume that, but I don't know. Um, like, do they have to enter from like basically from next to the fourth official? I, that would be my guess. I mean, that's probably where they'd have to go and and hang out, and then they'd get approved to come back on. Yeah, they get, could come back on and just hit the ground running and play a long ball over the side for the guy who just came back in the game. Well, I mean, we've kind of seen that with guys coming back from injury, which is always entertaining because people you know don't get upset about that at all. Never when that player is allowed to come back on when it's a big advantage. Especially when we take the stretcher out. Yeah. It's, it's just, it's funny that some of these potential changes were brought up by the American professional leagues back in the late sixties, where they were, you know, seen as heretics for even, you know, offering any of these suggestions about where the game could go and and what could change and all of that. Yeah. PD, what happens if a goalkeeper gets killed? Yeah. That's, yeah. Yeah. And then what? That would be hilarious. That would, hey, if you want to get rid, but if you're going to go to effective time, then time wasting isn't maybe as big of a deal. Although if the goalkeeper has the ball in play, yeah, like, see, you can go through effective all these Effective time, time wasting is even worse because they're not adding it onto the end. And it's a hard, it's a hard stop at 90 minutes though. Yeah. If the ball's in play, it is, but right. it's it, Jared, like the, the whole idea is they'd stop the clock when there's time waste. Okay. I see. Okay. I see what you mean. Yeah. yeah okay. If you're, yeah, if you're, okay. You're yes. If you're going to stop the clock when the ball is dead, then sure. Time, yeah. Then yeah. absolutely. Makes more sense. Yeah. Okay. I was about to say, if you're running the clock the whole time, and you're playing a hard set. No, no, time wasting is even worse. But yes, no, okay, no. I see what you mean. Sorry. No, that, yeah, that would make sense. Um, we'll see where it goes. Uh, I'm sure there's going to be thoughts about this as, as other countries hear about what the Dutch are up to, and IFAB's going to factor in in all of it. Um, I agree, Phoenix, that we would need better officiating to have all of this actually work. And and to me, that's the number one element from across the board everywhere is more development of referees in every country, not just the U.S., And we see where it goes. Um, Jarrett, we will hopefully talk to you in hour number two. Hopefully. Okay. We'll see you then. All right. Take care. Let's get Dylan Butler on the show with us right now. Dylan, the the Dutch are proposing some potential rules experiments in their second division starting next in 23, 23, 24. And one of them that I thought you might enjoy is a penalty box, essentially. So okay. yellow cards would see a five minute um, playing shorthanded kind of situation, according to the Dutch second division proposal. 
How crazy would that be in MLS? It would definitely be crazy. I, I don't know if, if uh, I mean, to me, I think, isn't a yellow card its own punishment? Like you need to put additional, I mean, I get it. I mean, you, you get a cynical foul, you get booked. Um, and if you're smart about it, that's it, right? So like, is there really punishment? Is there an advantage? There isn't, right? So to that point, um, you know, being a hockey lacrosse guy, I, I definitely get that. Um, yeah. yeah, I don't know. You know, it, it's actually starting to. Oh, see, the wheels are turning. Yeah, yeah. It's not bad. That's not bad. I, I don't like it for every yellow card. Like, I don't know if I'd want it for dissent unless we're just really what trying to stand have a mass out? confrontation and there's like four yellow cards given out? Do you go like okay. seven on seven or something? Yeah, like that? Let's yeah, do it. Do. It, it's like going, it's like going four on four or three on three, man. <laughs> and then you know there will eventually be like delineation of, well, this is just a two minute penalty. This is a five and it, it's going to get silly. Yeah. Like if you just uh, if a slide tackle with studs up, but it's a yellow card, that's a five. But if you delay the restart, it's a two. Uh, yeah, yeah. No, that gets a little bit crazy, yeah, right? It's soccer minors and soccer majors. <laughs> it would have a dramatic change Power play on goal. everything. Uh-huh. And this is something that it's <clears throat> come up in different leagues. I mean, I know they've talked about it in the UK because they, they like to call it a sin bin in the UK. Yeah. Um, it came up in the early years of pro soccer in the U S and never really went anywhere. Um, it is something like, I, I do like that, you know, we've, we've had a, a trial of a new offside law in Italy in the youth leagues. And, and we've seen a little bit of an uptick in scoring about half a goal a game from basically changing to where if any part of the body is offside, you're off to, if any part of the body is onside, you're on. It's giving you like a body length, essentially. Yeah. Arsene Wenger's proposed this. They tested it. Goal scoring went up by about half a goal. I like that we're exploring some things because I, I think it is kind of a good time with VAR and, and how we look at the laws of the game and maybe how we look at them differently to experiment a bit. But I hope they don't get too crazy, and I'm assuming they won't because of IFAB and the FA having so much control over it. I think they'll kind of tamp everything down. It's funny, too, because we already see – these arguments and, and, you know, what, that's not a yellow. Now it's going to be like, that's not a five minute yellow, you know, like <laughs> that's not a five minute major. Yeah. 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 It's going to be like even more arguments about, about that. It would be fast. And, and then think about this too, right? If you're the team defending that and you've got, you're a man down for five minutes, you are doing all the time wasting you possibly can, right? Doesn't that kind of take away a little bit from the game then? I think it could, but the uh, the Dutch second division, it's like five different things they want to test, but you can't test them all at the same time because then you're not going to get the answers because you bring right. up a valid point. One of the other things that they've talked about testing is the effective time deal that we've heard about before where they would, I'm assuming, stop the clock when the ball's out of play. It'd be two 30-minute halves and clock stoppages along the way. I think it should be two forties if you're going to do that. Any in my mind, I don't think it should be two thirties. But yeah, interesting. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. Um, the other one that I wanted your take on was all throw-ins could be kick-ins. Interesting. <laughs> you can so see why would you throw start. it in? Then why would you throw it in? Right. When I'm, you I'm assuming that. you wouldn't, unless you have Rory Delap hanging around and he can throw it seventy mm-hmm. yards and maybe have more accuracy. Yeah, I, don't, I mean. I think it just takes away the throw in then completely. Or do you, Probably. Get, or, do you or do you have the option of still doing a throw in and, and having a kick in? Depending on your accuracy and what you want to do, you could still have the option for both maybe. But I mean, I would say in general, especially with the motion to throw the ball in, you're always going to be able to kick the ball farther than you will be and able to throw. You could do it quick too. So right. I mean, I, I I would think that it would just replace it. But then the question would come up about, well, you can't be offside on a throw in. Would you be offside <laughs> on a kick in and all the other elements? So the, the Dutch have created a uh, hornet's nest right now. And we'll see where this goes. Um, MLS has experimented over the years with some some rule changes. The shootout was one of the best. And I really wish the Dutch would bring that back. Yeah, that was a lot of fun. Um, prefer that to PKs for sure. I do, too. I yeah. absolutely do. Um, I, I, I need draws. I have no problem with draws during the regular um, yeah, season, yeah, yeah. but I'd rather have the 35 yard shootout than penalties. And I feel uh, the same way, but I mean, this is completely off topic, 
I guess, but I, I feel the same about hockey. Like right. I'm fine with a tie. Like you don't, yeah. you don't, we don't need to have this uh, skills competition at the end of the game. Like, you know, I don't know. That's just... We need it in playoffs. You know, we, we need to get yeah. to a winner at some point. I'm okay with that. And, you know, cup competitions, I'm okay with that. But in the regular season, yeah, mm. ties a tie, draws a draw. It's fine. I don't have a problem with that. All right, let's get into some MLS stuff uh, that's on the board. Uh, Adam Buxa officially, officially gone, and it was a big transfer to League on ten million dollars, um, top six or seven transfers out in MLS history. I think we all saw it coming. Maybe if not the place that he'd be going to France. Yeah, and I think um, listen um, in in the, in the world that we're in now, in the league that we're in now, with with you know, everyone's saying it's it's a selling league. Um, with that in mind, I think New England's done an incredible job of that with their last three transfers, right? From mm-hmm. Buchanan to Turner <clears throat> and now Buxa. That's I want to off the top of my head. I want to say it's something like twenty four million dollars, right? Of yeah. of transfer fees that they yeah, that they yeah. get from that. The more in that ballpark, yeah, yeah. yeah so great, great business from them. Um, and I think especially in a Buxa, like a Turner. You know, look, they it's been well documented. They they kind of took a chance on a guy who, you know, wasn't drafted and and you know didn't start his couple first couple years at Fairfield. <clears throat> so he really blossomed. Um Buchanan blossomed as well. But Buxa was one of those that we're seeing more of an MLS now, right? And it and it was a great job by New England to get a guy at a at a cheaper rate, at a cheaper price have him play really well, turn him around now for a profit, right? So um, great business by New England, but now you look to the other side of it, the sporting side of it. They never really replaced Buchanan. Yep. It's going to be really hard to replace Turner. And now Buxa, yes, you have Bo, but who's with him now, right? So I think this secondary transfer window, I think is going to be huge for the Revs if they want to stay within that, you know, kind of elite level among the mix of the top teams in the East. Um, you know, on the one side, they did they did great business, but now they've got to turn that around, right? So what do you do with that money? How do you continue to have this kind of continue to cycle around? You've got to get, you've got to use that money now to get some good players. Now, Bruce Arena would argue with you that yeah. they replace everybody, but that's fine. Well, yes, he, he would especially <laughs> argue with you because he Probably. would say, well, Josie Altador up top. Well, Sebastian Legette replacing Buchanan, and they did sign a young goalkeeper. Um, but the results are not showing that the replacements have been good, and we'll find out about Buxa, who scored in his last what six? Yeah, and 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 you're and you're banking on a healthy Josie on turf for the oh, length of the yeah. season. Yeah, right. With, with the summer, with the summer now approaching. So, mm-hmm. oh, I know, I know. Just saying that he might argue with you. That's all. That's fine. <laughs> I'd welcome it. See, that never <laughs> happens with anybody. No, I've never had an argument with Bruce Arena ever. <laughs> not when he was coaching the Red Bulls or U.S. National. I team think right. I'm one of the rare people who actually has not had an argument with Bruce Arena. There's not many of us. It was it it was it was funny because back in the day, he was the coach of the Red Bulls when it was still a Giant Stadium. Yeah. So, uh, two two funny things about that. They had just relatively recently had turned to Red Bull. I want to say within a year or so. Yeah. Was he the first Red Bull coach? Was, was he, there somebody he, before he was before him? Osorio, right? So, yeah. Yeah, well, I think he was. so. Yes, he was. I, I think he was the one who took over in the first year of the Red Bulls. So the funny thing with that is, um, you know, product was a big deal at that point, right? Like with Red Bull. And it was just everywhere. Anywhere you could look, there was Red Bull. And there was no one swinging it more than than bruce arena like really? after training like before training like, he always and it wasn't even like they probably said to him you know listen you know if you can have a can in your hand it would help a little bit with what we want to do <laughs> but he just went full like monty with it and he was just like down and two at a time and uh, it, was, it was pretty funny but wow. but then but then also like you're in a you know like you, you guys have seen it like you're in a relatively small scrum, especially at the time, yeah. you know, like three or four reporters and, and Bruce, and you're like asking, you're trying to ask tactical questions and, you know, he doesn't, other than like the recent 
switch over the last couple of years to like stat driven stuff that he hates the most. Yeah. The second thing that he hates is, is talk of formations because he just finds it like, he's like, does it really matter if we're at a four, three, three, when we are against the ball, then we're with the ball. It's a three, you know, like, so he doesn't, uh, he's not a big fan of speaking about formations. Either. And, and did he, did he drink the Red Bull in the post game scrum in the middle of a sound bite, which would really mess things up? It's like, well, you, you go on a, you go on a rip. Well, he, did, he did have it. He did, he did drink it up at the podium and stuff post game too. But like, this wasn't even like with cameras rolling. Like it was just like three or four of us reporters in, uh, in an office it. in, in Giant Stadium and he's just pounding them. He just absolutely embraced the Red Bull purchase. <laughs> good, good for nice. Bruce. I, I would not have guessed that. I yeah. never would have had that on my bingo card. Um, <laughs> I also would not have had on my bingo card uh, some of the things that Christian Fuchs had to say yesterday. Yeah, man. We, we were wondering, is this going to come out? Are we going to find something yeah. out? And yeah. This... Like, come on, guys. Come in. I got something to tell you guys. <laughs> Ooh, this whole thing's been wild because it, it's like move happens where everybody is caught by surprise. Then you started to get these whispers, and, and Fuchs played into it as well about, no, we don't feel we've overperformed. We actually feel like we've underperformed, which no one was saying before the move. Nobody nationally thought. Nobody locally in Charlotte thought. And now that's kind of the accepted line coming out of Charlotte and, and some media and now Christian Fuchs that, no, we should have been better under yeah. Miguel Angel Ramirez, and we will be better going forward. I'm not so sure. Well, and then and then you you get even deeper into the weeds where he was saying his his office door was closed, and there was like this fracture between the players and and him. And and I find that interesting, right? Because it it <clears throat> reminds me a little bit of of the Atlanta situation even a year ago, right? Like you bring in, or is it two years? It's all the years are year ago. Than a year <laughs> ago. Uh, you bring in a guy from a different culture who has coached in different areas um, who has their own way of doing things. And maybe in those areas of the world, it's acceptable. Um, it wasn't the case here, but, but I do find it interesting that like, it's not like, all the players to him were foreign, right? Like he brought in no. guys that who have he's coached before. Were, was there not an issue with them, you know, or or are they just like, yeah, man, this is how he operates. It's all good. That, and the other, and the that's other guys, what's like, fascinating to yeah, me. Yeah, Th that is exactly where I'm at with this. Is wait a minute. There's a lot of players who either played for him or played in leagues where he's worked. Right. And would understand this way of working. Uh, one thing, quick on, on Heinze, and it's not a big deal, but. I uh, did find out after the fact, talking to, to people, and, and Mike and I have talked about this on, on different things. Uh, one thing that players across the board said was that Heinze's door was open. Like, he was willing to talk. Now, maybe he didn't implement things that people wanted. Or, he just wasn't giving you water when you walked through the door. Uh, yeah, reportedly, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Man, that thing got blown up so bad. That, that's, that's the Carol Swiderski situation of the Charlotte one. Right. Uh, something that seems like it got blown up early on and it has been blown out of proportion, at least according to Fuchs and everybody else, that that didn't happen. Um, the, the thing is with this is I really worry now about if there's a fracture between the team with the, the players and Ramirez, according to Fuchs, is there going to be a fracture within the team between right. players who were comfortable with Ramirez and liked him and players who didn't? I, I've heard disputed things back and forth about how many players actually were on Ramirez's side of things. And I'm not sure really where to believe what that number is. Yeah. And that whatever, it doesn't matter. The number to me doesn't matter. It just can't like any fracture is bad, right? It's kind of right. like when you're driving along and you hear a pebble on your windshield, like, what is that? And then it's a little tiny, you know, and then it, if you don't treat it, it becomes this massive, massive spider web. Right. And, that's the thing I think with any of these locker rooms, it's, it's always so delicate. Like mm -hmm. if you've got a very good locker room and like the NYCFC one is one that I brought up before because I fit, you know, physically been in there. That's been even before they won, before they won the cup of a, a very close locker room. And you could see it at, the, at, at training and, and, you know, even after uh, training guys just doing extra work and laughing and messing with each other. Like you could tell that was a tight knit group. Um, 
But when there's a fracture, even the smallest of fractures, like it, that's not good. That's, you know, that, that's, that's a problem because ultimately, you know, you need the collective to push you forward. N never more so probably you would say than an expansion team where, where it's such a, such an uphill fight just to, to, to push along against all these established teams. Right. So you, you do need uh, everybody in together uh, pulling the rope. And if one or two aren't, you know, that's, that's not good. And you end up with uh, Christian Latanzio, I guess, being the, uh, the Charlotte SC version of Safe Light, you know, Safe Light Repair, Safe Light Replace. It's Christian Latanzio. I mean, that's you have a, a sponsor. Yeah, I wish uh, it'd, it'd be like over that shoulder. Yeah, there you go. But I mean, it's and this is a tall order for someone coming in as an interim in this situation with all these, you know, reported fracture slash fracture slash whatever you want to call it behind the scenes stuff. I mean, this is a tall order for a guy coming into a situation that has a lot of noise around it. And, you know, the fact that it's in an international break kind of gives it the chance to calm down a little bit before, yeah. you know, you get back into everybody playing in, in, in mass. But I mean, this is a tall order for somebody like that. It is, but it's one that he's going to uh, embrace and, and, and go forward with, you know, like he's a guy, again, we spoke about it, uh, Last week that, you know, I, I, I've known him in his time with NYCFC as an assistant here under Vieira. And, uh, you know, he, he he's, he, you know, he's got the CV, he's got the experience um, and he knows well, like, it's not like he's coming in to the situation. He was in it. Right. So he knows uh, intimately what is happening there. Right. Like he's not being told by others. Um what the story might be. He was there, he's been there. So I think that helps in this situation. And um, yeah, I, I think it, it's a difficult job, but, but I think again, it's one that he'll, he'll do. Um, I'm, I, 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 out of all this, I'm just happy for him to have this opportunity. Um, and, and I expect him again to kind of take it with, with both hands and, and, and run with it. Yeah, my question, I mean, he, he'll have some growing pains because he's going into a role that he hasn't been in. I, I think his background, he, he obviously knows the game, knows how to coach. Um, he'll get through that. My question is a bigger picture when it comes to Charlotte. This sets a little bit of an expectation that the players are running things. Mm. And if they don't like the coach, then the, the coach is going to be out. And Christian Fuchs really stepped out in front of everything here. And, and look, he was the one who probably had to, right? Because he's, yeah, he's the, the yeah. captain. He's the the guy. We mentioned it with Swiderski and anybody else. Would they have the clout to get somebody fired? Well, Fuchs probably would. Um, should he? Is a different question. Um, because he hasn't looked all that great this season, to be perfectly honest. And I don't think he can play left back in this league. I, I right. think he'll get lit up with his lack of pace there. I just, I, I think Latanzio can be a great coach. I just don't know if he's in the right situation to be a great coach. And, and that's the concern I have for him, that it would affect him in the long term because he's in a tough situation. Yeah. I mean, you know, again, I, I think it, it's, well, it's obviously speculation on our point, on our part, right? Like we don't, we were not in there. We don't know. Uh, how big this fracture was with, uh, you know, with that was Christian Fuchs calling by the yes. way. Yeah, he, he said, we're good. We're good. <laughs> uh, Everything is fine. Yeah. No, 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 no fractures. None. Yeah. He's like, he's like that. Uh, what, what was that movie? Right. Like, was it one of the with naked guns? Like where they're like, you know, disperse, there's nothing or airplane, right? There's nothing. No, it, was, it was, was, it was naked. It was naked guns. Was Leslie Nielsen in front of the explosion at the yeah. fire. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, uh, but yeah, no, um, uh, we don't, we don't know like how, how much was it the players running yeah. the show versus the manager or, you know, I mean, how bad, I mean, you got to say this, right? The situation had to be pretty bad when you consider they were getting results and right. it's only a short amount of time into a, into a tenure, right? Of an expansion team. That's what's so baffling to me. And, and yeah. the, the part that, that baffles me more is now the conversation that is attempting to be spun. And I, I'm not buying it yet. We'll just have to see where the results are. But the conversation that I feel like is being spun out of Charlotte in that, no, their results that 
we all thought were really good. Everybody thought were good results, not on the road, but good results. They were competitive. They were playing above what anybody thought they would be that now somehow that's underperforming what they should have been. It's completely flipped and I we'll find out because we'll see what the results are going forward, but I'm just I'm blown away by that shift of hey, we're out out we're exceeding expectations. No, no, we're we're actually not. We're underperforming what the expectations were internally. It just doesn't make sense. I mean, you 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 wonder if that's if that's like a if that's like an internal talking point among them and a rallying cry for the group. And that does, maybe that's what galvanizes them and gets them going forward. And now that's just now Fuchs sort of outwardly saying what the conversation is within the group, you know, but I would agree. I mean, it's, I, I I would say that they underperformed at all, you know, like, but you know, look again, if if it's what brings them all together uh, and push them forward, then, you know, Go ahead, go for it. Say they say that you underperformed. It's going to be a fascinating story. Uh, it'll be one of the big ones going forward. Is how they look, and we'll find out this weekend where you get a I'm really tough test right? with Red Bull. So yeah, a, a team that if anybody knows who they are, it's the New York Red Bulls. Yeah. And what is Charlotte going to be tactically going forward? If they're not on the same page in this game, it could get ugly because the Red Bulls on the road have been great, and just in general, knowing their mentality, knowing their style of play. If you're not locked in, they'll yeah. punish you. Yeah, it's a, it's it's about physicality. It's about winning 50-50s. It's a it's about uh, just you know rock 'em sock 'em soccer, if you will, right? And that's what Red Bull is. And can they put um, that on banners and and put them up at Red Bull Arena, please? Maybe, maybe like there's no that. empty seats where you can fill the. <laughs> I was not going to go I there. Know, I, know. I went there. That's fine. Okay, cool. I wasn't going to do that. I didn't <laughs> want to get yelled at. <laughs> um, hey, let me ask you this about Red Bulls because I've been thoroughly impressed with Gerhard Struber. Um, I feel like from the day he took over to now, they have improved and they have yeah. fairly consistently improved and they still got room to improve. They can still get better. Um, is he one of the, the better coaches in the league that doesn't get enough credit? Probably, I think, because um, he's a system coach, right? So so the system, I think, gets the credit rather than the coach. Um, and he should. He should. Get, I mean, he should get the credit, I should say. Um, because just because it's a system doesn't mean it's successful, right? Like, And right. we've seen it stayed, it stayed the same system from Marsh to Armis. You know, it's a little bit of Carnell to... <clears throat> to Struber now and it hasn't been a consistent string of success right so um what he's done is in a in a pretty big roster overhaul was you know get a, a group fairly unfamiliar with each other last year with a lot of loan moves um and this year the guys who are back from from that overhaul last year are now better because they're in year two together right you've got it now a healthy Aaron long as well. And that, and that is a huge uh, part of it as well. And I think, yep. you know, goalkeeping wise, Carlos Carnell is another guy who doesn't maybe get enough respect that he deserves um, as, as one of the league's better goalies. So, so I think when you kind of throw that in, it's always a, the question is, and it feels like it's been that way with Red Bulls since probably the, you know, Brad uh, BWP at his peak is, that consistent guy in the attacking third, who is that guy? They've not really had it since that point. You've had flashes here or there. Um, if they can, if they can get more consistency from that position. Um, yeah. I mean, I, I think you'd have to say that, you know, they're either in that top tier of teams or just, you know, knocking on that door just below them. Who else in your mind, since we're talking coaches uh, and uh, coaches and players in the Red Bull system, who else in your mind in MLS has been either undervalued or underappreciated as a head coach this season? Um, well, I, I, I feel like because they won the cup, Ronnie Dyla isn't in that isn't in that anymore. But we did speak about that last year. I thought he was mm-hmm. for for a while. Another guy too, right? Who who just doesn't maybe get the credit because it's a successful team. Um, I would say, I would say, I mean, I guess it's debatable, but, but the other name that comes to mind 
for me is 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 Pablo Mastroani um, for the job that he does at Salt Lake, uh, and even last year, right? Like just to pick them up the way they did, and you know, yes, it was a bad officiating decision that gets them in, but when they're in, then you know they 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 uh, do a really good job uh, of it as well. So um, I would I would say. Pablo uh, going down in the East. I don't know. I mean, I, I guess Pat Noonan is getting credit, right, in Cincinnati. So I don't think he's under. A little bit. Um, and again, I think that's one of those two where we're hearing more about the system, right? Like, you know, two guys coming from Philly and playing a different way and not so much on on Noonan as uh, as a head coach. But, um, yeah, I think I think maybe those those are a few. Um, for me, I want to end with this, um, to kind of tie a couple of things together. You mentioned Bradley Carnell. He'll be with St. Louis next mm-hmm. year. Uh, we've talked about Charlotte and the roster build they've had and, and how disjointed it's, it's been. And you, you've got a core of, of Polish players. You've got Fuchs. Then you had the South Americans that you brought in to go with Ramirez. And it feels a little bit all over the place. Mm-hmm. St. Louis's roster build is not that. Um, no. It is very focused. It is very Bundesliga driven. Mm-hmm. Um, Carnell, with his background coming from the Red Bull system, should fit that. It feels like St. Louis has maybe learned some lessons from Charlotte and Miami, and it has a very clear plan under Lutz von and Steel and Bradley Carnell of building a team that is all pointing in the same direction. Yeah, I mean, it, it takes it usually, I should say, takes time for for teams, especially expansion teams, to get their identity right. Like, what is this team, or or how will they play? <clears throat> and you said it perfectly. I think we know right away what they're going to look like because we've seen it um, in Germany, right? So, um, it, it on, on one side of it, um, I think it's refreshing that that. Um, and, and you're hearing it from them too, where, you know, a lot of these guys are going to play for, for St. Louis too. They're coming yeah. early. So they're, so all of the sort of personal stuff and housing and, and acclimation, all that's going to be taken care of ahead of, of their first MLS game. Um, the stadium, everything is like ahead of schedule. Um, all those things are positives. They're putting all their eggs into that basket, right? Now that's great if it succeeds, <laughs> but sure. if it doesn't, Holy cow! What a dumpster fire that's going to be. Um, but I'm more I'm more inclined to think it would succeed because, as you said, it's 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 learning from other expansion teams and what they've done and 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 modeling your way of 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 doing things, right? So um, I like it. I think I think uh, it, I'm you know at at the very least you're intrigued to see how it's going to. Um, all play itself out, but, but you would argue that what we've seen from St. Louis in terms of their signings and everything early on, you're more like, okay, I could see that than we were certainly for Charlotte. Right. Cause like you yeah. said, we were like, well, I don't know, what are they doing? Why do they, they they don't have this. They don't, you know, how is this going to ma- mesh with this? Yeah. So um, I, from that sense, yeah, I think, I think it's, I think it should be good. Yeah, and look, we've seen this style of play have success in the league. We, we've seen it have success maybe to a point. Philadelphia is trying to, to push yeah. past that point. Um, I think Red Bulls are maybe a step behind them. Just I think they're, I think Philly has more talent than Red Bulls, if, if that's fair to say right now. 100%. Um, and I think stylistically it's similar. So St. Louis coming in with that kind of idea, pretty clear to see how they're going to play what kind of players they're going to look to get. I think four of the five that they've signed so far are coming from the Bundesliga. Yeah. Um, they're going to get them in early. I mean, all those things, you know, Carnell better than, than any of us, you know, is he ready to be in charge of a club that um, I guess is they have some pretty big ambitions coming in the door. I think so because, um, you know, he, he did have to steer the ship of Red Bull and, and got them into the playoffs um, and he had, a, I think, a, a big enough. Uh, it wasn't like it was two, three games, right? Like it was like mid season, I want to say. So yeah, it was a decent run. Yeah, yeah. So he probably had fifteen, sixteen games under his belt um, in the regular season, got them into the playoffs. So um, 
yeah, I, th I think, you know, much like Latanzio will, I think with Charlotte, you know, it's Carnell had to step into a situation and, and acquitted himself well, uh, certainly well enough where he was able to stay then on the staff. Right. Um, and, and, and now this is his chance to, to run his team. And again, it, a team that he'll, you know, we know how they're going to play. And and I think that's really important right away. But I think the biggest thing for me that St. Louis is doing right is getting the guys in early, right? That's yeah. huge. That's Even just getting them signed early, let alone oh, getting yeah. them into the yeah. country early. Yeah. And like, think about it too, right? Like they'll, even though it's with two, right? They'll be able to play together. They'll be in the yeah. same locker room. They'll be able to start to form these bonds in addition then to, to getting their families over and getting them into into housing and learn about the market and, and uh, you know, all those things kind of a lot of fans don't really think about how important that is, but it's huge. And to be able to do it so many months in advance of your, of your first match, even your first preseason, I think is, uh, is really, really big. It's something that I'd like to maybe all of us do a little bit of research before we talk next week. And I think we're going to talk on Wednesday again next week, Dylan. We've kind of been bitten by the golf bug here on, on SDH. I get it, man. Tuesday mornings, it's it's a good time since we work weekends typically. Tuesday is the day off. It's, it's becoming. Um, but I'd like to figure out if five guys before the summer window – before they come into the league is the most that an expansion team has signed. I know Atlanta didn't have five before that summer window. Um, I know Minnesota didn't cause I don't even think they were in before the summer window. Oh yeah. no, Charlotte didn't. I Miami, Miami had a couple early, right? They, they had at least Carranza. a couple. Yeah. They had a uh, Pellegrini and Carranza yeah. and maybe one Howard other. Uh, Nashville was a little active early. Um, they did the deal with Godoy, but I can't remember when that went down. Um, I'd love to dig into that a little bit as we get ready for the summer window where I would expect that St. Louis will be looking and will probably add a couple of pieces. They've got two designated player spots open and got a bunch of teams. that are going to be looking to do some business in the summer window. It can maybe be a little bit of a preview of what that looks like as we get back to full action next week. Yeah, no, it should be, it should be fun. Um, a couple of cool things for you guys as well going going far. I know you, you always yeah. ask me, right? And uh, yeah. I've got a couple of cool things in the in the fire right now. The uh, I got a chance to uh, speak one on one with Juan Carlos Osorio. Ooh, good one. Yeah, uh, it ended up being like a ninety minute conversation. I I I I think I told you guys last week. Like I I did cover him when he was Red Bulls yeah. coach. That was the year that they went on and and made the Cup final, losing to Columbus uh, out. I think at the time it was the Home Depot Center, but um, yeah, just you know, I feel like, we'll, and and I think the story is either going to hit today or tomorrow on MLSsoccer.com. But but it was, it was um, really interesting to hear. Hit he he's always so cerebral, right? So it's always great to get his take in general about the league uh, from when he was in it to what he sees now. Um, you know, he he talked about it. Uh, in, in in regards to sort of Argentina and and other leagues that are developing players and um, and selling them on uh, and uh, he said he said it was MLS in his mind in the last 10 15 years has made the largest jumps of any league in the world um, and again it's a guy who who you know it's not just a former MLS coach right it's a guy who coached at Mexico it's a guy who uh, has coached in Colombia and Brazil. So um, he's got a really diverse CV there, um, you know, and, and he hints a little bit at the end of, you know, maybe, maybe a return to MLS, you know, maybe now is the, the time. And, you know, you think about it too, when he was here, um, you know, everyone likes to, to joke and make fun of, of, of him, of him sitting with his notebook and tinkering. And, but um, he, he led a, a, a mediocre Red Bulls team, to, to the cup final in, in, yep. in the day and age where they didn't know where they were training day by day, right? There wasn't a training facility. There wasn't a Red Bull arena. They were playing at giant stadium. So I think it would be interesting to, to see what maybe he can do in, in a, in a league with more resources around him. Um, so, so that, that's, that's one. Um, and then uh, I got another pretty cool one for you with, with the, with the open cup kind of coming 
cool. close again. Um, had a great sit down with Jay Mims, the Union Omaha head there you coach. Go. Very so, nice. Uh, talked about you know their run and uh, and and what it's been like for them. And um, one funny thing I'll leave you guys with is. You know, we all know about the two hundred million dollar match, right? Like Nottingham, Nottingham Forest, right? Yeah, right. Well, they they played the twenty five thousand dollar match. <laughs> that is true. Yes, with, they did. Uh, Northern Colorado, right? And um, they won that, and and you know that was big. That's big for them. I mean, it's it's funny because you when you look at the economics of it, you know, with a, they play a Chicago, you know, Shakiri's makes probably five times more than that entire roster does, if not ten times, right? Where yeah. What does the average USL player bring in? Like twenty seven hundred dollars a a month, right? USL like League that. One, yeah, probably in that ballpark, or even less. Um, yeah. So, and they go to Soldier Field to do it. Then they go to Minnesota and do it. Um, you know, he's not quite. I, I asked him. You know, are you are you daring to dream of Champions League for Union Omaha? He's, <laughs> he's not there yet because he respects, of course, Sporting Kansas City, their next opponent. But um, they've embraced this run. They love it, um, and just wanted to kind of dive in on them a little bit and see, see kind of what makes them tick. So that'll, that'll be out on, on Monday. The Osorio story on MLS soccer should be like either today or tomorrow. So I need a union Omaha Joe public of Trinidad and Tobago match in the champions league. I need that to happen. That, or yeah, like a W connection or like, yeah, yes. yeah that'd be really cool. I, I don't know how they would get there. Like, you know, yeah, we're not flying charter. We know that. So yeah, well, I don't know how Trinidad and Tobago team would get to uh, yeah. Omaha either. So yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's going to be about the same. Southwest go there. <laughs> oh boy, <laughs> Frontier Need Airlines. To, yeah. Need it to happen. Don't we'll encourage Frontier Airlines on them, man. They take them all the way like out to Denver and Seattle. <laughs> you have to make nine <laughs> connections. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be on the lookout for those. Great yeah. stuff, Dylan. Thanks for the time, and uh, we'll talk to you next week. Bye, right, boys. Be good. Make sure you're following him, Dylan underscore Butler, on the social medias. John, why don't you tell us about our good friends over at Eliminize right about now? I could certainly do that. QR code over my left shoulder for those of you watching on Twitch. For odor free, clean, fresh air, one place you need to go. It's Eliminize service, deodorizing in closed spaces like houses, apartments, and condos. Eliminize has created a customized solution that eliminizes all organic odors, including those like pets, cigarettes, and food. Realtors and property managers use Eliminize service to eliminize bad odors to help them sell or rent their homes that much faster. It's a turnkey process. Makes it easy to work with realtors and property managers. Kind of the environment. We like that. A very green way of going about things these days to get rid of odors without any kind of toxic residue. Different than your favorite masking agent that you have under the sink, because when you go under the sink, you spray that masking agent into the air. That's why they call it a masking agent. You're just masking the odor. You're not attacking the problem all the way down to the molecule like Eliminize does with their proven scientific formula. Pricing easy one of two ways. Either buy the cubic foot or parts per million to come up with a price that's affordable for you. Results in 24 hours or less. And if you have any questions, frequently asked or otherwise, one thing you can do is go to their website, Eliminize.com, but do us a favor here at SDH. After the .com, go slash Atlanta so they know what part of the world that you are addressing them from. So your full homework assignment, E-L-I-M-I-N-I-Z-E.com slash Atlanta, Eliminize.com slash Atlanta. For odor-free, clean, fresh air here on a wall pass Wednesday, Alumni Service proud sponsors of everything, SDH. All right, we got lots of stuff to get into in hour number two. I did want to continue the conversation just a little bit uh, about St. Louis and what they have built as we were talking identity and and Bradley Carnell's name came up. I, I think Nashville is a little similar in that now they had a different runway. Remember, they had two years in USL and they hired Gary Smith for that. They didn't have one year in MLS Next Pro like St. Louis has had with Carnell in charge, but there's similarities. Um, I think they both hired a manager who is somewhat unheralded uh, coming in, but combined with the sporting side of the club had a very clear direction in where they wanted to go. Um, That's going to lead you to success. And and I think we saw it here in Atlanta. Uh, I think we saw it in LA. Um, varying levels of success along that and and look I've, I've said it consistently i'm not a big fan of the style of play and i was hoping st louis might go in a different direction there looks like they're not they're going to go into probably a very press heavy direction um it can be effective 
it, it can. It, has it won MLS Cup yet for anybody? No, it hasn't. Um, has it gotten you supporter shields? Yes, it has. The Red Bulls have some with a pressing style. Not all of their supporter shields come with a pressing style, but they have supporter shields with the style. Philadelphia has one in the COVID year 20. But can it lead you to the ultimate success in this league? Um, that's still a question to be answered, and, and we'll see how that plays out in a playoff structure league that has a different format. I'm, I'm really intrigued by what St. Louis is doing just because you see the sporting director hired. You see the manager hired. You see five players signed. It all fits. There's nothing that they've done that I'm like, huh, well, that seems really weird which seemed to be the general reaction to everything Charlotte did with their announcements coming forward. So it's really intriguing. Um, I think they'll be busy in the summer window for sure. Uh, I think they'll be looking to add some more pieces and maybe get guys over now. Uh, Burn brings up a question on the Twitch pitch, which I think is a good one, but this is always kind of the question when it comes to teams that want to play in that way is the, the skill players, the ones that can put you over the top. Can you get one that fits the style? Can you get one that, that fits that element that will do the pressing side of the game that you need to play in that manner, but can break a game down when they have to? Um, that's the hardest thing. And where are they going to come from? How are they going to get them? And how much are they going to pay for them? These are all questions. St. Louis is a, a club with, uh, it's a well-resourced club. They, they won't be hurting for cash. But what, are they, what direction do they go there? Um, I do agree when it comes to the, Nashville side of things, which is a different style of play. It's it's def, it's based de- defense first, but it's not about pressing. That's when we get into to styles and stuff. You, you really start with: Do you want the ball? Do you not want the ball? Are you based on what you do with the ball, or are you based on what you do without the ball? Nashville and St. Louis will be two teams that'll be based on doing things without the ball first, but they do them differently. Nashville had more space, I think, to have a player like Hani Mukhtar, who puts them over the top. He's a game changer. He's a match winner. And he's a really interesting one. Um, Burns says, I was thinking the other day, Germany doesn't have a lot of number 10s uh, behind Mueller. And Musiala is really the one. Um, so Mukhtar should get a look for the German national team. Um, I, I'd have no, nothing to say negatively about that. It's not really the kind of player. And I mean, his his background, Mukhtar's background, he you know left Germany to really find his success. The German game isn't one that necessarily embraces number 10s. I think Hansi Flick might embrace number 10s a little bit more. But in general, the number 10 hasn't been prioritized the same way as it has in other places. So then what does that look like You know, for a guy like Mukhtar, who's the perfect fit for Nashville? Would he have fit in a St. Louis? maybe, maybe not. But does that maybe give Lutz von and Steel a little bit of an idea of, huh, guy came up in Germany, left and found greater success. He would understand the mentality. He would understand the way of playing. Maybe they need to find somebody who has broadened their game a little bit or brings a little bit different flavor to that style. Maybe that would open the door to that. Um, in regards to Mukhtar to the, the German national team, it'd be incredibly fascinating. I mean, uh, Thomas Mueller is not exactly a traditional number 10, but he's playing it right now. Uh, Germany with a 1-1 draw with England yesterday in the Nations League. And uh, I thought some of the post-game comments were interesting. Uh, Hansi Flick said, I'm proud that we pulled off such a performance um, after the four Nations League games. We make a conclusion. We see how far we are. September will be the month for fine-tuning. Mueller said uh, it was a good game. We're st- we we're still only playing Nations League, which are basically friendly matches packed into a tournament mode. It's all about the feeling. If this game was repeated, we'd come out winners more often than not. Uh, Harry Kane penalty late got the one one draw in Munich. Uh, it was his fiftieth goal for England. He is the second English player to get to fifty. Wayne Rooney has fifty three. Uh, Kane's fifty are as many as the rest of the current England squad combined, which is pretty wild. Um, Nations League is Nations League. Thomas Mueller nails it right there. Like, is it a big deal at this stage? No, it's not. Um, does it get to be pretty nice towards the end when you have the the finals, the final four, whatever? Yeah. Okay, cool. It, it leads to something that's nice. 
but the group stage, it's it's organized friendlies. It's better than just random friendlies. I, I do agree with that, but it's just organized friendlies into something resembling a tournament format and whatever. When you get some knockout games at the end of it, it's good. Otherwise, it's just meh. A um, couple of questions quickly on this to, to keep the conversation moving, and we'll get to the rest of the news of the day. Tom Cato says, do you think St. Louis will be more patient with building once they start playing in MLS proper? Um, I, yeah, I don't know. I mean, it's hard to say. I don't know where their patience level will be. Um, I don't think they're coming in to be a bad team year one, though. I think they're coming in to be a competitive team straight out of the gate. So I, I don't think they're going to be like Minnesota patient. That's that's a whole nother level of patience right there. Um, I don't think they're going to be that. I think there will be some expectation on Bradley Carnell and the team. Um, but I think Lutz Fon and Steele also understands the situation they're in. I, I would hope. I think he's got a good understanding of MLS and how difficult it can be and how you know challenging it can be to win the league. Um, I don't know what the the bar is for them year one yet. They've only got five guys, so it's a little hard to tell. Um, I guess in terms of how much patience they'll show once they get in, I, I think they will be a, a team kind of like a Nashville in a lot of ways. I, I think they will be a team that will be tough to beat. I think they'll be a team that will not be expected to get blown out on a regular basis. I, I think they'll be a team that expects to be challenging for a playoff team, a playoff spot year one. Um, I think they'll do most of their business in building the team well ahead of uh, opening a training camp. I think that's the biggest difference with them compared to maybe some of the other expansion teams of recent years is I think they'll have the bulk of their roster ready to go day one of training camp. And really you're going back to Atlanta and, and LA and Nashville to a slightly lesser extent that could say that. So we'll see um, your thoughts on St. Louis just in general, John. No, I think that the build when you're bringing in a, a keeper like Berkey and you're you're making these steps ahead of time, I think that that's that's crucial in wanting to hit the ground, you know, hit the ground running when you're looking at, at Major League Soccer instead of sitting there and waiting and sitting there and go, okay, we'll we'll wait till this window to do something or we'll wait until training camp to do something. I think that the proactive nature that you're seeing from St. Louis with a philosophy in place, bringing in specific players. That's key here, and I think that it, it once again reinforces the notion that they're not just going to come in and they're not going to be a Minnesota. They're not going to come in and you know wait for MLS to come upon them. They're going to be proactive in this whole process, and it's, it's, it's good to see someone who has a homework assignment and they're fulfilling it instead of just waiting until uh, pressure and you know cramming for the test and then trying to get something done to put something on a piece of paper. I like the uh, the advance work for me. You're seeing a philosophy. You're seeing players of a, of a specific uh, archetype that St. Louis is looking to bring in here, and so I'm I'm looking forward to seeing who they bring in with the skill player discussion that we were having just a second ago. I want to see who they're going to add to Nilsson and Berkey and who they have playing in MLS Next Pro that we've seen so far this year. Uh, burned uh, on St. Louis uh, question about whether their strategy to play a lot of young local kids will work out. Is St. Louis really such a hotbed for youth soccer in the U S yes, it 100% is um, there is enough talent in the area. It's not just reputation. It's absolutely factual. And, and you're going back generations and generations of talent. So we talk about coaching all the time, right? Uh, we talk about how with the youngest kids, you're you're getting parents who maybe haven't played the game, maybe parents who didn't play at a high level, don't know the game well enough to to coach, to to get the foundational skills down. St. Louis, not a problem. Not a problem. Um, St. Louis, when the pro soccer scene was getting started in the, the 60s, St. Louis was the hotbed of soccer in the United States. Um, college game high school game, youth game. I mean, it was all unorganized at this point, but they were leading the way. Um, that's continued. Uh, they have got one of the best youth clubs in the, the country in the Scott Gallagher club. Um, they have a bunch of clubs in that area. It, it's maybe not as big of a market as some others burned, but in terms of history and reputation and teaching kids the right way to play, yeah, they'll, they'll be just fine. Um, I don't think you need to be like L.A. necessarily to be successful. 
I think you need to have the right things in place. Um, and St. Louis is a, a big market with a huge soccer background and a great youth system and a great youth scene. So, yeah, they can absolutely do that. Now, my question is a step further is stylistically, is that going to click with St. Louis? St. Louis has heavy German representation um, in their soccer scene, but also other European countries in their soccer scene. Uh, Bosnian, for example, was, was one nationality that you've had a lot of young Bosnian American players come out of the St. Louis area. Is that going to fit with some of the other types of players and backgrounds and feelings about the game? Is the German and maybe more of the pressing German style? I, again, we haven't seen it yet. I mean, we don't know. Bradley Carnell might open up the door to some different things. I don't think you can take the way the next pro team plays purely and say that's how the, the MLS team will play. Uh, but I think you can judge from the players who are being signed and Bradley Carnell's background with Red Bull kind of where they're going to go on the field with obviously a few tweaks because he's going to put his personality on it. Is that way of playing going to fit the St. Louis way? Quantity, they'll be fine. They'll have plenty of players to choose from. Quality, they'll be fine. They'll have plenty of good players to choose from. Stylistically, that's the one that I'm curious if they can bridge that gap quick or if it's going to have to be a little bit of an education of, hey, you guys do good work, but we want you to develop players in this manner to fit what we're going to do. And we won't know that for a little while. So it'll be really interesting to see where that goes. Jared's back. Yeah, he is. Oh, jeez, He's too excited <laughs> he's as well. wired up about something. No, just in general. That's good, I guess. Yeah, being optimistic about the world. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, are you optimistic about uh, Sepp Blatter and Michelle Platini and their trial that is starting today over alleged corp uh, corrupt payments? Um, started in Switzerland. Both defendants are, are confident. They're in a good mood coming in. Um, Swiss prosecutors accusing them of unlawfully arranging a payment of 2 million Swiss francs, about $2.08 million in 2011. Uh, Bladder and Platini say that they had a verbal agreement over the payment, which resulted or was related to consultancy work by Platini between 98 and 2002. Um, they face up to five years in jail. Do you think they're going to get convicted, Jared? Oh, heavens no. In Switzerland, you don't think so? I uh, haven't. No, I think there Why? will be. I think. Uh, um, I think there will just be something. May, oh, something will happen. This it feels like. Feels like just getting constantly teased whenever people associated with FIFA, especially the bigger names, smaller names, sure. Like you know, you're going to throw a smaller fish into the fryer sometimes. Um, I. I and please surprise me, Switzerland. Be totally cool with being surprised. Totally okay with being surprised here. I, um, but I, I don't always expect the big fish to fry. We'll see. We'll see what happens with that. Yeah, um, I'm fine being wrong. Absolutely, be over the moon. I mean, I feel like a, a two million dollar corrupt payment is probably the tip of the iceberg when it comes to FIFA. Yeah, true. You know, corruption, yeah. but. Eh, we'll see. I, I wonder if Bladder made the wrong person mad and, and they're bringing him to trial because of it. We'll find out. Uh, speaking of FIFA World Cup, we know the next steps to determine the final teams who will be playing in the tournament this year. Australia, who oh, nerve wracking for them to get over the United Arab Emirates. 2-1 late winner from Ajdin Hurstic. Uh, from Eintracht Frankfurt, 84th minute, took a deflection, was a really tough one. Um, the game was played in Doha, where the tournament was supposed to start, I think, this weekend, uh, if it was on a normal schedule, and the stadium was blasted with air conditioning to keep the evening temperatures down. So you can't play the tournament there right now because it's too hot, but you're going to play the playoffs to get there. Yeah, that was going to be my next question. Genius. Yeah. Genius, because you got two more games coming. Um, genius, I tell you, genius. I don't get it. Ugh. Thank you for that commentary. Just, uh, it. Uh, 
You didn't have to continue with it. We we got it the first time, John. Just mm. <laughs> anything else be, beyond noises at this point? <laughs> no, considering nothing surprises me when it comes to putting on an event in Qatar. Okay, Sad, sadly, nothing surprises me. Yeah, we're gonna okay, we're gonna have you play, but yeah, blasting air conditioners. Well, I mean, they they had to do something. Know, like, what, do you want them to I, not blast the air no, conditioners? But, <laughs> no, but it's just the the notion of okay, yeah, we're just gonna we're gonna crank up the AC. Just come on, this is just. How about just play the game somewhere else where it's not so freaking hot? You could do that. You know, that's it's a wild, crazy idea. How about you do what you did before, where you had home and aways to decide these spots? How about yeah. that? Yeah. Anything but playing the knockout games. In eleven the tournament, in degrees. the place where you can't have the tournament in the first place, in the time of year when the tournament would have been normally played. Anyway, jeez, um, you've got next week Australia hosting Peru. Uh, it'll be hot. Good luck to both teams in dealing with the heat. Uh, Australia is a big underdog, and I think they should be because they have not looked good in qualifying. They did not look good against the UAE, which they should be handling pretty comfortably. Peru is a minus 120 to win that one right now. And then Tuesday next week, Costa Rica and New Zealand. Costa Rica is an even bigger favorite to get through. New Zealand is the 101st ranked team in the world. They're a plus 450 to get through. Uh, Jarrett, do you think it's Costa Rica and Peru getting through? I do. Um, Australia has been... Man, Australia has been been like a bomb scare. It's not good. Mm -mm. Um, and New Zealand, it'd be cool. It'd be cool if you got there. You know, I don't really think you want to have to go through Costa Rica. Um, I don't. It, Costa Rica has that kind of energy of, uh, I'm not trapped in here with you. You're trapped in here with me. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I, I, Australia just has regressed. And I think the bigger questions for the Australian game are going to be domestic. Um, what happens with the league, which has not jumped forward. There were people who tried to lead you to believe that, that the a league was going to surpass MLS pretty quickly. No, not so much. Um, J league either. They haven't really done that either. Um, I really intrigued by what Dylan told us about Juan Carlos Osorio and and his comments about the MLS being the, the league that's grown the most worldwide over these next few years. Australia shows you, you know, where a league was that was maybe in the ballpark of getting towards MLS's level um, 10, probably more like 15 years ago and hasn't progressed, has not grown. It is the same as it was then, and the national team has felt the effects of it. They are not as strong as they used to be. Now, they're also in Asia as opposed to Oceania, but still, they haven't grown past being a team that would win Oceania and then get knocked out. Now, after coming in with a, a really a golden generation, now they're a team that's struggling to get out of the Asian qualifiers. And I think Peru has a huge advantage in this one. The A-League has not grown like they wanted. The The leadership of the A-League, Tom, has not been very strong either. Um, I can't speak to it from an expert perspective about how the league has handled things. But we know during the pandemic, the issues with the broadcast side and TV contracts and money coming in, they, they had some real issues with finding anybody to televise the games. And it seems like it's been a challenge, even with the partner that they had. I think they ended up going with Paramount in, in Australia. And it's been a challenge. You know, those games aren't really shown worldwide, not like MLS is. Uh, they just haven't been able to take the next step. Uh, the FA and the A-League, there are issues there as well. And, you know, again, when you want to bring it back to the United States, that's one thing that having the league work closely with the Federation avoids that stuff and you see things moving in the right direction at that level. This is, I think a really good comparison for it. Uh, Jared, are you going to watch the Scotland Armenia game today? Uh, it depends. Uh, it depends if I have time. Um, I'm intrigued by it. How about that? Why? 
uh, because I want to see how they, even though it's a friendly, I want to see how they play after really laying an egg in World Cup qualifying. I want to see who they who they give who who plays. You know, who's going to play? What are they going to do? Uh, we've got TV Azteca. Now this is out of Mexico. Uh, TV Azteca. You said is, Azteca. I assumed it wasn't Azerbaijan. I'm clarifying because of what I'm about to say. It's about Jarrett. This is a big deal. That's why I stopped you with the alarm twice. It's not funny. TV Azteca is reporting that Byron Castillo falsified documents to prove he was born in Ecuador, Ooh. and they will lose their spot in the World Cup. Uh, and Chile will take their place. Yeah, we've talked about this a lot. This whole cool. issue has been going on for a while. When it was brought back up, what my feeling was that they're going to have to prove that something was falsified because Ecuador was given approval to play in. Now, TV Azteca, and this is the first place I've seen it, and I'm, I'm being very clear to say where it's coming from. Yeah. Uh, after weeks of tension, FIFA have determined that Ecuador will be left out of Qatar 2022. Its place would be given to Chile because of Byron Castillo. Um, confirmed that Byron Castillo falsified his birth documents and is Colombian, so Chile would be entering the World Cup despite having been sixth in CONMEBOL. Now, I don't know why Peru wouldn't jump in and Chile would go into the playoff. I'm not sure. Yeah, that, well, maybe because I, I don't it's know if it's games. a matter of scheduling and it, logistics. It's, no, it's the okay. games that Sorry. he played in, is my understanding, but I'm not 100% sure on that. Uh, TV Azteca says that they have learned this. FIFA will announce its official decision in a couple of days, but it's been leaked that the elimination of Ecuador is imminent. <sighs> now, this is... TV Azteca saying this. Um, let's see. Uh, the lawyer representing Chile in this, Eduardo Carlezzo, um, revealed in a press conference carrying after carrying out his investigation, they found out that the birth certificate is false, um, saying he was born in Ecuador. He's not. Saying he was born in Colombia. Um, in addition, the Ecuadorian certificate does not have fingerprints. Uh, Chile's accusing the civil registry of Ecuador and the football federation to rig that process again. So it's, it's getting past the, can we prove that he's eligible to play? Oh, FIFA says he can play, go ahead and play to. Yeah. The reason why they allowed him to play is things were falsified. That is where it comes up. Um, now this is really complicated uh, because of the whole history of it. And we need to go back and go through all of it. And it sounds like FIFA is not going to announce anything officially imminently. Although if it's leaked now, maybe they do. Um, what would happen is the games that he played in, basically those games are going to be uh, forfeits because they used an ineligible player. Peru would continue as fifth in because of those results. They would stay in the game with Australia. Chile would jump to four. Um, and that's that's where it stands right now. This is TV Azteca reporting this. And, and we've had this conversation about Byron Castillo many times. But TV Azteca has just went with this. I've not seen it anywhere else just yet. But yeah, that's that's being reported out of Mexico right now. I haven't seen when we've talked about the conversation, we've tried to throw the caveat out there consistently about FIFA allowed the games to go ahead. They gave the go ahead with Byron Castillo representing Ecuador. If this gets overturned, it's because something's falsified. And, and that's what's being alleged. And that's what's being reported right now. Nothing official. Uh, the case has been heard. It's all done. If they've made their decision, I don't know what the holdup is. And this is just being reported from leaks. What, this could, is not, nowhere near official yet. Could the holdup be CSA related? Like, would Ecuador be able to take this to CSA? CAS, yes. CAS, I would, I'm sorry. I would assume that they would. I would assume that would be immediate. But I don't know if FIFA would hold it up because of that. Because it doesn't affect the playoff game. So it's not like they have to, hold, to get it done fast to make sure that, okay, then if Peru's not in the playoff game, whatever, then it goes the other way. Um, so it's not going to affect that either way. It would be Chile or Ecuador going, the other one not going. So I, my guess is if they come out and say, 
Ecuador's out, Chile's in, it's because of falsifying documents, then Ecuador is going to go to the court for arbitration of sport and appeal it. And if CAS says, well, Ecuador's right in this, then we get into a really difficult spot because FIFA is not bound by the CAS ruling, not legally, but generally we see those rulings take effect. So I don't know. That's all. That's speculation down the road. Right now, we're going to wait to see if FIFA announces anything regarding this. But it is being leaked, and TV Azteca is the first I have seen with it to go to that degree and say Ecuador is going to be kicked out of the World Cup. Yeah, Carletso apparently also pointed out that uh, the fingerprints of the player, and this is translated from Diario Ole in Argentina, Fingerprints of the player Byron Castillo do not exist, and we do not know why. That is not a minor issue when analyzing a person's birth certificate. That certificate only entered in 2012. How does it enter only after 14 years, I ask? Yeah, and and if if it's that, I don't really get why he was allowed to play in the first place. Um, I I. The question of falsification is going to be the bigger one here. And that's where it's going to get tricky. Now, again, I, and I just I have to keep stressing this. This is being reported in the Mexican media. Um, now, it's there, there's talk about the case in other places. And Juan Arango, who, who calls games in English on Paramount Plus for the Argentine League and many other places, um, He shared a tweet yesterday about the Chilean Federation presenting to FIFA a copy of Byron Castillo's baptism certificate from Colombia. The case FIFA was set to announce what they would do here on this on Friday, Mm -hmm. Wednesday. It's been leaked now. Um, You know, people coming into it people in Chile were not expecting this to go through. We've, we've had the conversation. There wasn't really much to say that, you know, you would go through with this until you start getting into falsification of documents. And that's where it gets very tricky. Um, looking to see if there's any other follow-ups here. Uh, have not seen anything from any of the heavy, heavy hitters just yet. Um, but that's where this it is, stands at the moment. Yeah, this is this is interesting. So, like breaking it down for a second, like in you know, Matterflow is Mel Matterflow is breaking down of the yeah. Sorry, right now. Um, sorry, bud. Um, to his point, you know, it sounds like that they didn't play him for a while and tried to be careful with this in the first place. Yes, yes so that is I, my understanding. So I. I have a lot of questions about who did what due diligence up to this point, because if they were holding him out in the first place to get assurances and then played him, then what are those assurances worth in the past? Well, but, and this is why I've said it the way I've said it consistently is the assurances were based off whatever information was given at the time. Yes. The information that was given was falsified then you you've opened up another door you've opened up a different conversation if you know yeah you can play him based off what you've given us but then what was given was not factual then yeah you have to be punished um now also um this is another element that is interesting to it and it does get into the uh, fifa regulations it's very unlikely because chile has brought this case forward and i think because of the way the results would go if, if Ecuador forfeits games that Castillo played in, they would go with that obvious solution, with Chile replacing Ecuador as the uh, fourth-place team in South America. Um, there is a outlet in the FIFA regulations that due to a serious breach of, of the regulations, and Ecuador, if, if that's what they say, it's a serious breach of the regulations, Italy could get in because they are the best ranked team not in the world cup that they would replace <laughs> ecuador wow. that's very unlikely because yeah, yeah. Brought by chile and chile would have a legitimate 
beef about it because of the games that were played. But if it turns into a situation where, yeah, we're not going to go down that road, Chile, you're not getting in Italy. Come on down. Yeah. The games he, if, if this is the case, the games he played in that would have impacted things were combat ball games. It should be a combat That's, ball team. I would agree. That's that would be the way to go. If you put um, Italy in here, like, putting Italy in here is like a Vince McMahon move, y'all. Yeah. Yeah, no, it, it absolutely would be. Um, so Modiflo, um, and I'm, I'm going to paraphrase a little bit Modiflo so we don't get in trouble. Um, half the qualifiers Castillo didn't play because they were trying to make sure he was going to be eligible to play and people were wanting him to play. And then they got assurances that he could play. Um, it's crazy. I don't think Italy gets in. Don't even worry about that. That is That is a possible way of getting through this um i agree burned whoever uh found the baptism certificate in colombia probably got paid a pretty penny by the chilean fa i don't know how much money they all have. of combat ball should be at the door of fifa with a pitchfork if they put italy in that you oh, take brother. away you, oh, the, to, i mean and, and i know you're just going through the you're going through the proper procedures jason i'm and I'm not yeah, saying I'm, that I'm you're saying, saying that that's that what's going to happen. Yeah, I, I don't think it happens, but it is a possibility of how it gets resolved. Yeah, it's but all of Combat Ball would be at the door of FIFA, ready to burn them down. If you are not taking away one of our spots and giving, and giving it, it to you, away from our Fed. Yeah, <sighs> brother. Yeah. Um, well, I think the decision was supposed to come down on the tenth or the fourteenth. Friday. Friday. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. Mentioned a minute ago. Friday. <sighs> According to reports, FIFA didn't say they'd have it on Friday that I've seen. It was reported that they would have it on on Friday. Um, if if we're if we don't if we, I'm in, I don't mean it to sound like not to like doubting it, but if if we don't see like Tahi say and places like that pick it up, I'm going to be watching it real damn carefully to see what happens Friday. Now again. Um, to follow up a little bit on this, because you know things have started to come out on on this uh, back and forth hearing. I, I don't know what the proper term would be. Uh, Carletzo, the lawyer for the Chilean Federation, translated said, "If Ecuador goes to Qatar, the World Cup is tarnished." I just I'm going to leave that alone on many different levels, but okay, I know what he's getting at. Um, the Ecuadorian Twitter account for the national team, La Tri at La Tri. Uh, posted a picture of Castillo smiling and uh, the emoji there with it. Um, and, and as it's translated, an emoji looking askance. I like that. Um, okay. <laughs> if Chile doesn't get what they want here, they could go to another level too. They could go to two more levels. So if they, if FIFA says no, Ecuador didn't do anything wrong. Yes, Castillo shouldn't have played. That's on us. They didn't falsify anything. Whatever. Somebody did. Whatever. Whatever. If, if they come out and say it's not Ecuador's fault, we don't like it. Castillo can't play for Ecuador, but no Chile, you're not going to the World Cup. They could appeal to the next level in FIFA, which is the FIFA appeals chamber. If they don't get what they want there, then they could go to the court of arbitration for sport, which is outside of FIFA. So Ecuador would have essentially the same level of appeals. So this is not going to get resolved super fast, any which way. FIFA appeals chamber would be the next step for either one. Court of arbitration for sport would be the last step for either one. Um, yeah, uh, the Ecuadorian media obviously reporting, you know, on some of the comments that Carletzo made, uh, not really all that positive about Carletzo's comments um, saying that he's basically trying to get them a world cup spot for Chile at the table rather than on the field. Um, I don't know again. And, and this is the reason why we're talking about it in this detail, because generally it's been a lot of, he said, he said back and forth and the player was allowed to play. The, the caveat I've always had to it is if they find out things were falsified. And if the player falsified them, that's a tricky spot. Because if Ecuador as a federation doesn't know it's falsified, should they be punished? 
And that's probably going to be part of Ecuador's case if they are ruled against here is we didn't know we had nothing to do with the falsification. It was given to us and you're going to have to throw Byron Castillo under the bus at that point, if you're Ecuador, because that's your only way out. And if they didn't do anything to falsify it and they were given documentation that he can play and they showed the documentation, everybody agreed that he could play. If he can't play, does the team get punished for that? That's a tricky spot. And yeah. there's not an easy answer to that. Because if you say yes, well, then you're punishing a lot of players. You had nothing to do with it. You're punishing a country. You had nothing to do with it. They did their due diligence on should he be able to play. They put their case forward. They, it was agreed that he should play. If, you know, I that's that's where it could get to me. And that's where I don't think there's an easy solution. And nobody's going to be happy at the end of that. But it's being reported. And it's beyond just the back and forth of comments in a hearing and all that. It's beyond that where TV Azteca is saying, based off leaks they've gotten, Ecuador is going to be kicked out of the World Cup. Uh, yeah. But the Federation can sit there and and deny. It's like, look, we're operating. Well, that would be their argument, of course. Yeah. Yes. I mean, but that doesn't solve anything either, John. Like, that's, that's what I'm saying is like, Sure, they can say what they want. Chile can say what they want. FIFA's got to make a decision. Then the decision's going to be appealed. Then it's probably going to get appealed again to CAS. Like That's pretty much where we are. And I don't think, from what we know, I mean, okay, Carletto bringing up that, you know, why wasn't there a birth certificate done in Ecuador for the player? Why was it 12 years or 14 years after they were born that you got a birth certificate? One, that does happen. Um, it does. It's not common. No, but it does happen. Uh, the baptism certificate in Colombia is going to be an issue of overcoming that. But that doesn't necessarily say that the Ecuadorian Federation did something wrong. And, and that's where you get into the trickiest element of this. You can go round and round about what should happen here. But I don't think it's cut and dried if it comes up that players' documentation was falsified in terms of who he should be able to represent. But the Federation had nothing to do with it. It was presented to them. They checked it out. They presented it to the authorities above them to ask if the player can play, and they got the go-ahead. If the Federation had nothing to do with falsifying it, I don't think they should be punished. Now the player should be a hundred percent. And, and look, it's, you know, it's not fair. He, he had nothing to do with his birth certificate when he was a baby. But if you get to that point and the family or the player or representatives or whatever have falsified it to be able to play for one country, then yeah, the player has to be punished. The player has to be banned. But I don't know if you can blame the Federation if they did their due diligence on it. And that's where you get into this gray area that I don't think is cut and dried in how you deal with it. I don't think it's going to be easy to deal with. Um, there have been issues with Ecuador in the, the 2015 U17 World Cup. That was age falsification, not nationality. Um, and that's happened with other countries, too. Uh, Mexico missed the 1990 World Cup with that. It's a really tricky one here because I just don't think there is going to be an easy answer of course you're going to come out with the bombastic statements if you're the chilean lawyer of course you're going to come out and say the world cup's tarnished uh, the the qatar world cup is tarnished if ecuador's in it yeah i think it's tarnished for other reasons but anyway of course chile is going to argue that but did ecuador did the federation do something wrong or did the player do something wrong and if the player did something wrong and the federation tried to find out if the player did something wrong and couldn't find out that the player did something wrong and was told they could play the player, should they be punished with losing a World Cup spot? I don't think that's an easy yes. I really don't think it is. So you're going to have to get past, to me, even the documents falsified. Who falsified them? If you can prove that the Federation had something to do with it and presented false documents that they knew were false, 
then absolutely they should be kicked out. 100%, no question, easy answer. If you can't prove that, it's a tougher conversation. And I don't think it's an easy one. And I don't know how you're going to resolve it because it's going to be appealed both ways. And it feels like one of those that is ruled on, the appeal takes it another way. The appeal to the appeal takes it another way. I don't know. What are you going to do, have a playoff game? I, I don't know. Byron Castillo Cup, winner goes to Qatar. Yeah. Have it in September. I, I don't know. That's what you're looking at at this point because I don't know how else you're going to solve it. Yeah, I, I I know this. My gut tells me this is going to Cass. Well, of course it's going to go to Cass, no matter which way it goes to Cass. I mean, if if Chile doesn't get this one and they go to FIFA appeals and they don't get that, they're going to go to Cass. If it goes back and forth, it's going to go to Cass. Of course it's going to go to Cass. There, there's no way around that. And yes, Cass is actually important and has some some clout here. But does FIFA then, if they go through their appeals process, do they go along with what Cass says at the end of it? Um. Or then do you get stuck in a limbo? And, and I look, you only have so much time. Yeah. You know, I mean, you've got to make these decisions pretty quickly. And I don't know. I don't know what direction it goes in. Yeah, I don't either. And it's, you know, you, you analyze this and this is not going to be an easy case to prove. Because of all of the deniability that can be brought up in any kind of a defense from from any side in this. And, and that that to me is the, the element here for me is that there's enough wiggle room. There's enough of a window where someone can sit there and say, well, we did what we were supposed to do. And whether you're talking about the player specifically or the federation or what have you, there's to me, there's enough legal wiggle room here where it's going to be tough to sit there and pin something on the Federation that they willingly, unless there are documents that come up that the Federation willingly did this and was party to all of this saying that, yes, he is, you know, that he can legally represent us as a member of our national team. I think there's wiggle room here to have enough deniability. I I don't know. I mean, we're going to find out. Um, Let's, let's go back to Tim Vickery's article in may to try to get the big picture here if you're just catching up on this um tv azteca out of mexico is reporting that ecuador will be stripped of their world cup spot it will be given to chile um the fifa decision was supposed to be announced on friday according to reports it's been leaked according to tv azteca in mexico now, Tim Vickery's piece back in May, again, it's kind of the, the, the overhead view of all of this. So you've had these kinds of issues come up in pretty much every World Cup qualification cycle in all parts of the world. Um, in 2018, Chile missed out. Um, Peru got ahead of them on goal difference. Peru went to play in the playoff with New Zealand. They got the last spot. Chile... In that qualification process, this is 2018, they were held to a 0-0 draw by Bolivia. Bolivia brought on defender Nelson Cabrera in that one. Cabrera had been born in Paraguay, recently naturalized by Bolivia. According to Bolivian law, he had been living in the country for three years. That was enough to naturalize him. FIFA regulations required a five-year period of residence. This is from Tim Vickery's ESPN article, May 6th. Cabrera then should have been ineligible. He shouldn't have been on the field. Chile launched an official protest. They won their case. They were awarded a win. Um, But because he had played in a game against Peru, they were also awarded a win. So it was a wash. It didn't help Chile get through. But Chile was involved in that in 2018. So now, in this case, Chile did their math before bringing this case forward. Byron Castillo, you went through the games that he played. And it would benefit Chile to bring it forward. And they did. Um, Basically, the allegation was that he was born in Colombia, not eligible to represent Ecuador. Um, The eight matches that he played in for Ecuador, two against Chile. If they were reallocated, that would move Chile from seventh to fourth and put them into the World Cup spot. That's why they brought it forward. Um. One of the things that the, the Chilean lawyer said, that if, if the groups hadn't been drawn, if there were more time, then it would be obvious that they would be ruled in the, in the right on this one. 
Uh, Ecuador's FA dismissed the initial claim on May 4th. Uh, unfounded rumors designed to destabilize the squad who, by those who want to prevent its participation in the World Cup. Ecuadorian FA said in a statement, we must be emphatic that Byron Castillo is Ecuadorian for all legal effects. Um, there's been lots of back and forth between fans of the two countries, media, all of it. Um, Ecuador and Brazil have had problems in recent years with player documentation, but like El Modiflo said, it's been down to age alteration. Typically agents falsifying documents, trying to make players seem younger than they really are. It's come up in baseball, right, Jarrett, with with agents trying oh, to make a player seem younger. To tale as old as time, especially, you know, you're trying to get somebody recruited out of you know Cuba or Central America. You're trying to you're trying to make a 21 year old seem like he's 18, 19 years old right. so you can get more money. Same thing in soccer. You're trying to get somebody eligible to play in a U17 or a U20 World Cup you can launch the career. Um, Castillo. Ecuadorian side Emelec made it public in 2015 that they would not complete a transfer for him because they weren't sure about his documents. Two years later, 2017, he was cut from the U20 team because his real age was in question. Chile's FA alleges that Castillo had been playing with false papers that distort his real age. The age doesn't matter here, but it gets to the validity of the documentation. Um, the Ecuadorian FA made sure to tread carefully here. He was playing for Barcelona in Ecuador, uh, went all the way to the semis of the Copa Libertadores last year. Uh, in April of last year, so April of 21, the Ecuadorian legal system carried out an investigation and concluded that Castillo was Ecuadorian. It seems that an older brother with a similar first name, uh, Byron, B-A-Y-R-O-N, uh, now deceased, may have been born in Colombia. But Byron, B-Y-R-O-N, was from Ecuador. With this decision, Castillo was brought into the squad. So the legal system of Ecuador concluded that Castillo was Ecuadorian. He was brought into the squad, um, made his debut last September. So this is different than the Cabrera one, which is more administrative with Bolivia. This is Ecuador saying they did the investigation. He's good. Um, he played his whole career in Ecuador. He's a product of, of Ecuadorian football. So it's not like he's a newcomer to Ecuador. He's, he's been there since he's been a player that anybody's known of. Um, really weird situation with that. Now, what I don't know and what Modiflow, if, if, you know, maybe you're, you're with us here, maybe you can clarify this. So the, the legal system of Ecuador did their own investigation. They come up with the, the ruling that he's Ecuadorian. He comes into the squad. My understanding is that that ruling was accepted by either CONMEBOL and or FIFA, and they checked on that before they played him. That was my understanding when they played him. Um, I think that's an important element of this because if, again, if if a ruling is brought to you and, and why it's ruled as such is brought to you and you say yeah that's good we're good um yeah i modify that was my understanding so if, if it's different we'll, we'll have to just get to it and there's a lot of back and forth and a lot of things get lost in all this so it's it's complicated but if he was ruled ecuadorian and he's obviously been in ecuador for a long period of time and he hasn't represented anybody else so you you're not getting into the like he represented another country He's grown up as an Ecuadorian. He's been there for more than the, the five years of whatever FIFA regulation on that to be naturalized. It's going to be really difficult, in my opinion, for Chile to get this. And that's why I haven't really ever put much stock into this. Because if Ecuadorian authorities say he's Ecuadorian, whether he's born there or not, if he's a citizen, he's a citizen. Now, if if he didn't go through the naturalization process, even though he grew up there, you're getting into a gray area. Yeah, and, and I, I, I can understand that, but should that gray area get a team kicked out of the World Cup? Like that's that's where I keep coming back to the more we, we talk about this and, and dig deeper into it is 
I mean, Amadafla says he's more Ecuadorian than me. Um, yeah, like if he's not naturalized, why didn't they naturalize him? Um, why didn't they naturalize him at any point along the way? I mean, you're talking going back to 2015 with Emelec being interested in signing him. I don't think there's enough to get a country thrown out. Like, if you want to suspend the player, and even that I think is kind of harsh. Okay, if you want to demand that things are, are carried out in a more clear way, okay, all that's fine. I'm, I'm with you on that. But it's not like they brought in a player who had only been in Ecuador for six months. It's not like they brought in a player who had only been there for a year. You're well past the five-year thing for FIFA. He grew up in Ecuador. He developed as a player in Ecuador. We see players who are born in other countries play for different countries all the time. He didn't play for anybody else. Like, why wasn't it buttoned up is one question, and it's a valid one. But even with that, it shouldn't be an issue. It shouldn't be an issue. And Modaflow is, is upset, and I'm with you. Um, and Tim Vickery talked about it. Uh, who was Chile's most impactful player during this past cycle? Ben Brereton Diaz. Mm -hmm. Uh, ben Brereton Diaz, I mean, and, and Vickery says it at the end, Brereton Diaz was born in Stoke-on-Trent. That is not Chile, by the way. That is England. He plays for Blackburn. He represented England at the youth level. He incorporated the surname of his mother to represent where she was born, and he was eligible to play. He was called up for the first time about a year ago. He didn't speak any Spanish. Um, and here's the quote from Vickery. In any real concrete sense, Castillo is more Ecuadorian than Brereton Diaz is Chilean. And that's that's a completely factual statement. I get the questions. I get Chile being desperate to get in. I understand that. It's the World Cup. It's a big deal. I understand it. I get the questions about where he was born. I totally understand that. This has been fuzzy for a minute. But this player was developed and has spent all of the time, it seems like most of his life in Ecuador, if not all of it, except for where he was born. He is Ecuadorian. And if it's a paperwork thing, that should not override what's right in this situation, in my opinion. Um, we'll see. But again, to go back to the beginning, if you're joining us later, TV Azteca in Mexico is reporting that they have gotten leaked information that Ecuador will be kicked out of the World Cup over this scenario with Byron Castillo. And Chile will be going from seventh to fourth in the table and going to the World Cup, uh, obviously, pending appeal. Uh, absolute, complete and utter mess. And yes, Chile did try to bring in Robbie Robinson. That is another one. Um, I, yeah, I don't know. Uh, I don't know how we get to this point, but this is where it stands right now. TV Azteca went with that not long ago uh, this morning saying that that is a leaked piece of information they've received. FIFA is supposed to announce a decision on Friday now that you have a leak out there, unless TV Azteca is incorrect in their report, which look, they could be, but this has been gathering momentum in South America with lawyers making statements and back and forth. Um, maybe it gets advanced a little bit because you are going to have multiple appeals no matter which way it goes. Yeah, cool. this, is, this is the absolute beginning of something that has... Friday is the next element in the timetable, and then we'll continue to have timetables after that. But yeah, this is absolutely crazy that uh, we're seeing this now. And then you have multiple governing bodies that are going to have to operate on the hop to try to get something done if there's going to be any kind of a change with uh, who's qualified and who hasn't. It's not crazy in that it's happening. It, it's crazy that the leak is that Ecuador would lose their spot in the World Cup. Yeah. To me, that is the crazy part. Um, Chile pushing to get it. Look, um, they're desperate. I think that's kind of obvious. But the fact that the leak is not 
Chile's case is going to be denied because that would be, I think, the realistic assumption here. Again, no matter what direction you go, the player grew up in Ecuador. He hasn't represented anybody else. If he was born somewhere else, that doesn't make him ineligible to play for Ecuador. Question would, would come around to citizenship and what that looks like. But that's a different conversation than bringing a player in who obviously had no ties to Ecuador and played. That's not what happened here. So that, that has to be understood. That's not the way this went down. Um, Chile's lawyer, look, he's, he's, he is lawyering well. He has been very outspoken, Eduardo Carletzo. He has been quoted in many media outlets about all of this. Um, he said, uh, we have, we delivered all the tests and the players Colombian, but the world cup is close. And what we ask has never happened. I can say with complete certainty that if we had more time without raffled groups, I have no doubt that we would have a favorable, favorable decision for Chile. But when there are tickets sold, travel packages, all the preparation for the world cup, the easiest decision is to leave everything as it is. We will go to the court of appeals. And then if everything is still negative, the sport arbitration court CAS, um, now, Carletso goes a step further with some quotes, and this is translated from, uh, uh, it goes to uh, this article. It's one of the, like a, a all-world news aggregator. Um, and I can't tell what agency reported this, but Carletso says this, and this is a quote, I Again, it's not in Spanish. This is in English. Um, it was translated by the news agency that has posted this. From the beginning, the Ecuadorian Federation knew of Byron's past. That's why they separated him from a sub-20. They had the whole story and had received complaints, but they never did anything. Is it because the player was too good to take him out? The falsification of player documents is not something new in Ecuador. Carletzo went on to say there was a consolidated data falsification scheme in Ecuador of local and foreign players. Since the pressure was so great, the Federation was forced to sign a collaboration agreement with the National Civil Registry Office. Precisely that institution would become an inspector. The topic was that big. So, wow. OK, he, he did take it there. Um but separating him from the sub the the U twenty is a different conversation. That, according to Tim Vickery and other reports, was about age, not about where he's from. Um, is he too good to take him out? They didn't play him for a long time in the qualifiers, so that's not exactly valid. Uh, he's throwing a lot of gas at Ecuador here with this, beyond just trying to get Chile into the World Cup. Good grief! Um, played in eight games. In South America, the qualifiers, they play 18. He didn't play in 10. He played in eight. So they went through all that period of time. Um, yeah, this is this is a big one. This is going to be a wild one. He started in what, Modaflow, September? Thank you, September of 21. Um, so he missed the first 10 because they were investigating, trying to get this clarified. and. It seems like their clarification was good enough for him to be allowed to play. And now it's been questioned. But again, it just comes back to the, the feel here. And, and, and Jared, uh, before we get into other news to finish up here quickly, um, just last thoughts. I mean, it comes down to feeling what's right and what's wrong from a feel perspective, because I, I don't think the paperwork side of things is going to be very definitive here. The player no, is Ecuadorian by all accounts of how he has grown up, where he has developed as a footballer, everything you can get to, he's Ecuadorian. And if they rule that he, his participation should eliminate Ecuador from the World Cup, I feel like that's a miscarriage of justice. I think a lot of this is going to hinge on who did what. Um, you know, if it's him and agents who are falsifying documents – then you get into some really weird stuff where if the player and the agent took documents to Ecuador and to Comet Ball and FIFA and said, here's what I got, and everyone went, okay, cool. Then yeah, it feels it feels really tough on Ecuador to punish them if it's that. If it's, you know, it's the FA in Ecuador that did it, then you know it makes a little more sense than that. Um 
Here's one for you. How long until we hear from Columbia, who finished sixth in combo ball? I know he didn't impact them directly, but how long until they stand up and say something? Their results don't go their way. They can't. The results, if it, it, that, and that's why Chile did the math here, because they would jump Colombia because if yeah. the results are forfeits in the games he played in, Colombia doesn't jump to fifth. Colombia doesn't go anywhere. Colombia is still out. It's Chile who gets the advantage, and they go from seventh to fourth. Just, it's very. It's going to, I mean, this is to, to, to John's point, like this is not, this isn't the end of this story. It's just another beginning. This won't end anytime soon. There will be uh, CAS appeals. There will be finger pointing. There will be things thrown, possibly literally, definitely metaphorically. It will be ugly and there will be more and more yelling for sure. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's going to be a mess. Um, anything else on it, John, you want to throw in? Uh, just quickly from La Tercera, uh, this is once again translated uh, from them. They say that the situation that Byron Castillo is experiencing today is not new. This is because the team that formed at Club Norte America has 73 cases of players who have presented irregularities with their identity. In Holy fact, Moses. in fact, in a series of investigations carried out in 2017, double birth certificates, unvalued registrations, non-existent certificates, as well as impersonation and double identity were found. Yeah, no, I get all that, but I still keep coming back to should he have been a citizen of Ecuador either way? Yeah. Yeah. Like, yes, they should have handled it differently if that's what it comes down to. But if they didn't, if, if everything pointed to him being Ecuadorian, then you're not having to naturalize it. What are you naturalizing? But he, it's not like he, they, they brought him over six months ago. That's where I'd have a problem. I'd have more of a problem asking about Ben Brereton Diaz, even though he's absolutely eligible to play for Chile. He had nothing to do with Chile. Yeah. Zero. Robbie Robinson, nothing to do with Chile. Nothing. Byron Castillo is a product of Ecuador's league system. Like, yes. And he's more ingrained than those other two individuals in what he has been experiencing as a football. He literally speaks the language. Kind of a crazy thing. Um, ben Browning is has shared this. He writes for 90 Minutes Football. Um, he's got the check mark. He has uh, shared the TV Azteca article. So um, that is the only major outlet that I have seen who has taken it to that level. That's where things stand right now. Um, we'll keep you posted, obviously. It's a massive, massive story. Uh, I burned. I totally agree. I, I think there has to be some common sense in this. Um, there has to be because he's an Ecuadorian player. He's an Ecuadorian player. And yes, it is very complicated when you get into where he was born, where he was not registered as a soccer player, where he was, you know, registered as a you know, child, all those elements. Um, that all is complicated, but he has grown up as an Ecuadorian and he should represent Ecuador. And if that gets overturned on paperwork and allegations from the, the Chilean lawyer, that is not accurate about the, the, the sub 20, the U 20 thing. I mean, that's, that's about age, which is an old, old different issue, but that has nothing to do with this issue. He didn't play in that. There wasn't a question about, was he Ecuadorian at that time? It was about his age. And yes, North America, you probably should stay away from that club and get people out of there. But that, that's not the big deal. Again, that's, that, it's, it's like getting into the argument about, oh, well, Canadian soccer business only gave $3 million to the Canadian Soccer Federation. Oh, that's a big story. $3 million more than they had ever gotten for that mm-hmm. stuff. So like, it's not the story. The, the U-20 thing, it's not the story. North America, it's not the story. Did the guy grow up in Ecuador? Check. Was he approved to play? Check. What does his birth certificate say? What does Ben Brereton Diaz's birth certificate say? He was born in England. Oh, he shouldn't be able to play. Oh, but he can. Now, they should have cleaned this up better. Of course, whatever the situation was, they, they should have gotten everything knocked out. 
but I don't know what they could have and couldn't have done. I don't know Ecuadorian law. I don't know where things stand. I don't know what naturalization would be if you didn't think you needed to be naturalized. Like you're not going to, you can't retroactively do it. I don't know. The guy grew up, grew up as an Ecuadorian. He should be able to represent Ecuador. It's, it's going to be a huge mess no matter what direction it goes. To me, it should come down to common sense and he should be allowed to play. We'll find out if that happens, but reports are that that is not what is going to be ruled on, at least in round one. The ruling, according to TV Azteca, that's been leaked is that Ecuador will be kicked out of the World Cup. And yeah, that'll be one of the biggest stories we've seen in a long time. Um, other stuff before we go, uh, there will be stoppage time today. It'll be me solo. We're going to try to take a little bit different uh, approach with it. We're going to get into some... Uh, fun history things with Atlanta United in that we're going to talk a little bit about Pachuca as well. Mike's on vacation. He is in, enjoying, I think Hilton Ed. I think that's where he went. He, he's on a beach and I think it was Hilton Ed. Um, so it'll be me solo for stoppage time at two o'clock and we're going to get into some different things there. Other news before we go, Canadian men's national team, they are going to play against Curacao in the nation's league on Thursday in Vancouver. Uh, after opting out of the friendly against Panama, they returned to training on Monday. There are future meetings planned, but there's no resolution to the CBA with uh, Canadian men's national team, Canadian women's national team, and the Canadian Soccer Association. Jamaica returned to the field last night, and they won 3-1 at home over Suriname after uh, their travel issues from the weekend that saw the general secretary of the Jamaican Federation uh, forced out. Um, they did win 3-1 in their return to play. I do not believe they trained before that, but they got the win over Suriname. Uh, in the U.S. Nations League group, uh, Granada got a 2-2 draw at home with El Salvador last night in St. George's. Uh, they head to Austin to play the U.S. on Friday night. El Salvador will play the U.S. Um, in El Salvador on June 14th. And a big win in the CONCACAF Nations League for the American Virgin Islands. Uh, 208th ranked team in FIFA. They won 3-2 over the Turks and Caicos Islands, who's 206th ranked team in the FIFA rankings. It was a 96th minute penalty. First win for the U.S. Virgin Islands since 2011. Well done. I mean, they beat a team that's at the same level, so it's, I don't know how big of a win it is, but it is a big win. They got their first one in 10 plus years. That's what the great stories of the Nations League. Uh, some of the rumors and innuendo to keep an eye on Eric Ten Hag going back to Ajax to go shopping. Julian Timber, 20-year-old defender, part of the Dutch squad for Nations League. Uh, Manchester United would like to bring him in. Tottenham would like to bring in Alessandro Bastoni from Inter Milan. Uh, Liverpool would like to get Darwin Nunez, a Uruguay striker from Benfica. It's going to cost them about 85 million pounds to do it. That would be a club record. Manchester United and Newcastle also chasing Nunez. Uh, Rafael Leal is being chased by PSG, Newcastle, Chelsea, reportedly Real Madrid previously. He is at Milan and they are trying to get a new deal done with him to keep him. Milan is also trying to get Sven Botman, who has been linked uh, with Newcastle previously. They're also trying to get Renato Sanchez, both from Lille. Milan are trying to get those deals done. Botman, according to Antonio Vitiello, has a personal agreement with Milan on a five-year contract. He wants to go to Milan. He doesn't want to go anywhere else. Lille wants to sell him to the Premier League because they think they'll make more money. Uh, the player is like, nope, I don't want to go there. They're trying to work through it. Uh, Sven Botman needs to go somewhere because he has been talked about every single week for a year plus now. True. Just move somewhere, please. Um, Aurelian Chuameni is a step closer to Real Madrid. It's going to be about 100 million euro. One thing on Real Madrid to keep in mind is that they can't sign any more non-European players this year due to their non-EU slots being occupied. None of the current ones, which they have three in the non-EU slots, are going to get dual citizenship until January. So they can't sign anybody else that's not EU. Keep that in mind. Gabriel Jesus was one that was linked. Uh, I don't think he has uh, dual citizenship in, with an EU nation now. I don't know why he would. And he was linked with Real Madrid. They can't sign him. They, they, they can't get him. Um, He's still expected to leave Manchester City, but Real Madrid would not be able to add him. Angel Di Maria looked like he was going to go to Juventus. They're not feeling confident about it, according to Fabrizio Romano. 
they put a two-year deal in front of him. He wants a one-year deal. Barcelona are interested. Xavi has spoken with Di Maria, as was reported yesterday. We'll see if a deal gets done. And Napoli are progressing in talks to sign Federico Bernardeschi as a free agent um, from Juventus. They want to get him. He's interested. He's open to accept it. They're going to talk in coming days to complete the agreement. And last one that is important uh, here at this stage, and we'll save some stuff for tomorrow. The idiot moron jerk who ran onto the field uh, after Manchester City won the title and taunted Robin Olsen of Aston Villa. He has been uh, banned for four years from football. Paul Colbridge, 37 years old from Salford, approached Olsen after the game. Um, he had also provoked away team's fans. Uh, the prosecutor said that the behavior encourages others to act in a similar fashion. Uh, Colbridge, and the BBC says he is uh, of Whitegate Drive, uh, pleaded guilty, um, ordered to pay a fine, 795 pounds fine and costs for the case. Uh, Colbridge said it was a stupid act and something I regretted immediately. To me, it was fueled by alcohol. The following Monday, I sought out someone from the club and sent an apology by email. I also apologized on one of the city forums. It was a moment of madness, pure elation. I wear my heart on my sleeve. I've been going to city for 20 odd years. I'm a season ticket holder and I've never been on the pitch before. Pure elation has nothing to do with getting in someone's face and trying to provoke them into a fight, uh, Paul. Um, four years is not enough. Nope. 795 pounds is not enough. Uh, I don't care how excited you are about your team winning the title. You don't get to run and try to provoke a fight with the opposing team's goalkeeper. You're an idiot moron. Paul. Okay. Paul Colbridge needs a lifetime ban and a fine of more than just basically a thousand bucks for a moment of madness going onto the field. Just because you buy a ticket doesn't entitle you to go pick a fight with the opposing keeper in a moment of elation and madness fueled by alcohol. Not an excuse, Paul. Lifetime ban. Sorry. Should be. Should be. And it should be held up as an example. They did talk in the case. Um, they did talk about how there has been an uptick in these situations. Um, but this is what we got right now with Paul. Paul, when you get elated and you decide to try to pick fights with people, uh, maybe you should talk to somebody about that, buddy. Jarrett, your thoughts? Yeah, you got to make use them. You got to make examples out of people in these situations because if you don't, you know, you just, you're going to keep having it happen. Um, mm -hmm. And eventually something really bad is going to happen. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to hear anyone tell me about how it's overreactive because it's only overreactive until something really bad does happen, whether it's a fan assaulting a player or a coach or a coach or player losing it and you know, striking a fan. And then we get all these arguments about, you know, who's the victim, this, that, or the other, when you shouldn't be on the damn field in the first place. There's calling it, calling it elation and joy and trying to parlay that into your excuse is just, absolute childish bs because you don't know how to act in a great moment like sure it's a fun moment for you your team won everybody running on the field and the fact that this keeps happening is just embarrassing and the fact that you don't punish people correctly means that people watch this and go oh that's a minor that's a minor you know that's that's a minor slap on the wrist for going on the in the field in that great moment yeah, that's worth it. That's worth the potential punishment for what I'm doing. No, make it a legitimate punishment and make people realize if you do this, that's pretty much going to be it. You're not going back to those grounds. You're going to have to watch it on TV. You can run in your backyard and celebrate. That's going to be the extent of it. How do you handle this better? You ban him for life. And in four years, if, if that's where you really think it should be, if he applies to be reinstated, then you can have the conversation at that point. But you ban him for life up front. You, you ban him for life up front, and then if you come back to it, then the story is not, oh, we banned him for four years, and that's really going to teach him a lesson. It's, whoa, banned him for life? Wow. If he gets reinstated down the road, then that's the, the, the subtext to it. That's fine. That, that's not as important in the long run. It's the initial punishment. It's got to be better. And you want to get rid of it? 
it's got to be better. You got to come out stronger. And if people then make appeals and they get it reduced, I'll, I'll, I'll deal with that. That's fine. I can, I can deal with that. That's better than light punishment. Four years is not light. It's, it's four years, but still compared to what it could potentially create, the punishment needs to be stronger and make them go through the process of appealing to get it reduced. That's where I would go with it. Um, on the good side of things to finish up, uh, Amazon Prime, they have announced an Argentina national team series starting with last year's Copa America, and it'll go all the way through to the World Cup. It's going to start on July 10th, one year after Argentina won the Copa America. Um, some great quotes have come out about what they're going to have in this. It's going to be a really fun watch, and it's going to be kind of episodic to get you all the way up to Argentina, I guess, getting to the World Cup um, in November. So going to be a fun one. Looking forward to that. Amazon Prime's done a pretty good job with all these kind of series. So looking forward to it. And it's going to be worldwide. So it will be available in the United States. And I'm guessing with subtitles. So enjoy. I know I will be. Um, one question I did see come up on the Twitch pitch a bunch because we're getting closer to it. Next Thursday, we're supposed to get the announcement about U.S. World Cup cities. There is not a time attached to that announcement at all, and I don't know of anything around events yet with it, but stay tuned. Um, I have not seen anyone announce a time for when that announcement will happen. So stay tuned. We'll be all over it for sure. Just just buckle up on that. A um, couple of other programming notes. Tomorrow night we will be in Fayetteville at the Lion Creek uh, Bus Barn, Beer Barn. Uh, it's their other place. We've been to the one in Peachtree City. We're going to be in Fayetteville. Uh, check out our event on Facebook for more details. Uh, Lion Creek, great brewery, great partner for us. We've been there multiple times. They do a lot of things in the, the local community. Excited to be there. Jessica Charman will be hanging out with us. Uh, we'll talk about all kinds of things and not purely Charlotte. We're going to talk about lots of things uh, with Jess hanging out with us for the show. Um, that's tomorrow night. We'll probably be live a little bit closer to seven o'clock on the Twitch, but uh, stay tuned for that. We'll we'll give you a little, an update as we're heading south for that. Um, today stoppage time, and then Friday. We've mentioned it on soccer over there. Friday is the first night of the fifteenth annual Five Hundred Songs for Kids event. The Songs for Kids Foundation is one of my favorite Atlanta-based charities. This event is one of my favorite fundraising events that is done in Atlanta every year. It's back now, finally, officially, in a normal sense. Um, this one will be at Venkman's, and we will have tickets for the Atlanta United Pachuca game to give away to people who attend. Donations are accepted at the door. It is a pay as much as you can. I think $5 is the minimum to get into the event. It is an event where bands, local bands will be performing a song they wish they had written in the 80s. Uh, band will do a song. New band will come up to do the next song. It's a really fun event. You'll get to see a lot of artists that you've probably never heard of, some that you'll become big fans of, uh, some really cool performances, a lot of fun, and it goes to one of the, the great causes in, in Atlanta. We will be there on Friday night. Hopefully you can join us at Vinkman's as well, and we will have Atlanta United Pachuca tickets for people who make donations up to a certain point and while we still have tickets. So stay tuned for more details, but that will be at Vinkman's uh, 500 songs for kids, the songs for kids foundation, just one of my favorites in Atlanta. And I'm glad we can do something to help support them and spread the word. That's going to do it for us. We could keep going about Ecuador and Chile, but they're going to be fighting for the rest of the day and next day and probably on Friday until we get an announcement. Next time they play a friendly is going to be amazing. Uh, so I'm yeah. sorry, not a friendly, but a competitive game. Yeah, but I, don't see them, I don't see them playing a friendly anytime soon. I don't see that happening. Uh, we'll keep you posted on everything. Stoppage time, 2 o'clock on twitch.tv slash stoppage time at 929 and on facebook.com slash 929 the game. And we'll see you tomorrow morning. Mucho plato. Mucho plato. Mucho plato.